Well, good evening, everyone. Sego ani buju endio wachea kwekwe. As the mayor of the city of Kingston, I offer these words in the spirit of this gathering. Let us bring our good minds and hearts together as one to honor and celebrate these traditional lands as a gathering place of the original peoples and their ancestors who were entrusted to care for Mother Earth since time immemorial. It is with deep humility that we acknowledge and offer our gratitude for their contributions to this community, having respect for all as we share this space now and walk side by side into the future. And I will say just in recognition of the fact that um, this is the last council meeting before the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, uh, that I have brought uh, the talking stick uh, that was a gift from our indig from indigenous communities here in, in Kingston uh, to, um, to display here in council as a recognition of the importance of, of that relationship. So with that, uh, we will just note that we were meeting earlier in closed session. Uh, we did discuss several items. Uh, first, uh, an organization update. Uh, we discussed the recruitment of the new commissioner of community services. We discussed a potential acquisition of waterfront property and also future industrial lands. So I will ask for a motion to waive our procedural rules and have the clerk report, please. Moved by Councillor Stephen, seconded by Councillor Ridge, that council rise from the Committee of the Whole closed meeting that the rules of bylaw number 2021-41 be waived in the city clerk report. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Moved by Councillor Tozo, seconded by Councillor Saves, that Jennifer Campbell be appointed as Commissioner of Community Services, effective September 20th, 2023, and the CAO be authorized to finalize with the individual the terms for employment for that position in accordance with existing compensation and employment policies and procedures. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Commissioner Campbell. Commissioner Campbell, on, on behalf of Council, we want to say congratulations and we look forward to working with you in your new role. Okay, so with that, uh, we will move on to the approval of the adits. We have two sets of adits. Uh, we have the addition of Clause 3 to Report 77 and some communications. Can I have a mover and a seconder for the adits, please? Moved by Councillor Tozo, seconded by Councillor Stephen. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Are there any disclosures of potential pecuniary interest? Okay, seeing none, we have no presentations this evening, so we will move forward to delegations. We have three delegations this evening. First, we will invite Trevor McCaw from Renewal Squared Incorporated, who will appear before council to speak to deferred motion number one and clause one of report number 77 from the CAO with respect to textile recycling. And just a reminder to our delegations that you have up to five minutes to speak, and then we will open up to questions from members of council. Mr. McCaw. Do I, can, I control the slides as well? Okay. Uh, good evening, members of the City Council and Kingston residents. Um, today I'd like to take the time to provide you an update on the prom promising proposal um, for the partnership between the City of Kingston and Renewal Squared. Um, if you recall, we had, uh, there was a proposal back in J uh, July for a uh, textile recycling program. It was deferred until today, and uh, one of the requests of council was to gather some feedback. So what I'd like to do is provide an update on some of that feedback that we gathered and a little bit more detail on the program. Um, the first thing is I think we need to talk about some of the hard truths before I get into the details. The textile industry is one of the largest contributors to global and environmental degradation. A staggering 85% of textiles still end up in the landfill today, and it doesn't need to be that way. That's what's crazy about it. The clothing industry alone accounts for about 10% of global emissions, and despite the vast number of garments produced annually, most textiles still get wasted and are one of the uh, waste categories that is least recycled. Um, our current solutions today just aren't working. We have to make a change. Something has to change. And anyone who's reading the news headlines over the last 6, 12, 18 months would agree that the time to act is, is, is upon us. This is where Renewal Squared can help. Um, after reflecting on the feedback from the last session in July and the council meeting um, and our outreach to the Kingston community, we'd like to highlight some of the insights of our proposed uh, pilot program in addition to what was included in the original, in the original proposal. 
Um, the first is, and I don't think this came out clearly in, the, in our initial proposal, was the impact on the local economy. Part of our plan is to hire local Kingston-based um, employees to service these bins. So we'll have people who are employed in Kingston who will service, empty the bins, um, and be out there every day making sure that the bins remain clean, professional looking. The second is the support of the Kingston nonprofits. Um, we believe in giving back. It's core to our mission. It's core to what, something that we believed in when we started the company. A portion of all of the clothing donations and the funds gathered will directly benefit Kingston nonprofit thrift stores. Um, we've spoken with several of them and they've been interested in collaborating with us throughout the pilot. Um, I don't think anyone believes we have all the, all the answers today, but that's part of the benefit of the pilot is to work with the Kingston nonprofit so that we can map out what is that ultimate kind of win-win between the residents, the, the companies or the groups providing the recycling and the, and the Kingston nonprofits. One thing that was interesting, and I actually was surprised at the answer to this, was the impact of the really large uh, companies that have entered the circular economy, like a Value Village or Talese. Um, they have a short-term minimal impact, but the folks we met with said that over the long term, it was really a negligible impact on the charitable donation. So I thought that was promising that the, that the community can absorb that circular economy, that addition, without um, hampering the charitable donations. Um, the next is um, the crisis of stuff is, re is real, and it's something that we need to tackle head on. We believe that the proposal that we made back in July could save up to 250,000 pounds of clothing um, just in the first year alone. That's tens of truckloads of clothing that won't end up in landfill. So we're excited and we believe um, that the opportunity, the opportunity is just too big to, to not uh, act on it quickly, and the, the environment needs the help. The next thing is our bins. Our bins aren't just any bins. Um, we've taken a lot of time and effort to make sure that the bins um, work for these types of municipal partnerships. And one of the big things we do is they've been designed to be safe, but one of the biggest things is, is that they're electronically monitored 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And what we do is as they fill up, we deploy the team to, to service those bins. Again, local team nearby um, to empty the bins so that they don't overflow. One of the most common problems is overflowing when they fill up. People don't take the stuff back home, they leave it outside, and it's unsightly, and it's, it's not good for the residents, it's not good, it doesn't benefit anybody, and if those clothes get wet, they're much, much more difficult to recycle. So, um, in order to maintain pro professional looking clean bins, we use the monitoring and empty them around 70 to 80% full. Also minimizes the carbon footprint, we only have to go out to a bin when it's full, we're not, we're not stopping by when they're 20% full, putting two bags of clothes in a truck and driving away. 30 seconds. Oh, um, okay. I'm gonna move quickly. Um, we think it's um, urgent that we go. We think the, the urgency of the climate issues have never been more paramount. Um, we believe our pilot is more than a, just a proposal. It's really a call to action. Um, we think we can run this pilot and really contribute to the Kingston economy through reduced haulage fees, contributing to the nonprofits and the economy, and we need to act on the environment. The, the residents need it, and uh, we think we can make a real, really big difference. So I urge you to consider moving forward with the pilot as it was proposed in July. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions from Council? Uh, Councilor Stephen. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and through you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I wanted to ask about climate impact in a slightly different way. So Council has an information report coming tonight on adapting a climate lens uh, for the city and we want to know the GHG impacts of our decisions um, because it's really important. It's not something included in reports yet, uh, but that said it's coming and it would be really helpful if you could tell us a little bit more. So just one of the things I'm wondering about is can you tell us where your materials are shipped? Are they kept in Canada? Do they go overseas? What does that look like for you? Yeah, so we have a tiered process by which we um, um, put, the, put the clothes back out into the circular economy. The first and foremost is to keep them local. So once we have a local presence, we work with typically for-profit and non-profit thrift stores or online resellers or fiber recyclers, and we try and keep it local. I mean, the, the, the perfect scenario is the clothing never leaves the community. That's, that's the top priority. Second priority is to keep it domestically. So whatever we can't source locally or what the market can absorb, it's a market, so it moves and flows. Like what, what happens one month may be different the next month. Then we move to kind of domestic North American. So there's a number of graders and sorters. So we take the clothes in aggregate 
and then they're um, um, sold to or shipped through graders and sorters, and they sort through it and put them into high value industrial rags. Um, you know, they, they categorize them on, um, among a number of different categories. So that's kind of the second priority. And then depending on the demand, sometimes seasonally or sometimes depending on, on the economy, different things, we also will sell, sell them overseas. Now we've taken a lot of care in where we sell them overseas. There's you can do a quick Google search and see the disasters that are going on in Africa where these clothes get shipped over and 50% of them end up in landfill. We work with a, with a broker who um, validates the local buyers. Um, we typically only ship to Latin America, so not Africa. We, we, we actually are not interested in any of that. And they, vet, they check and do qualifications that the uh, buyers are putting as much of that clothing back into the circular economy as possible. So, we're, we, yeah, we kind of step down the chain from least environmental impact, and obviously if you're shipping them farther away, there's a bigger carbon foot, but but net-net, it's a huge carbon savings. If you ship 40,000 pounds of clothing to Minnesota or to Manitoba, it's still tremendously beneficial from a carbon footprint versus um, new garments and water usage. The amount of water required to make a garment it depends on the fabric, but it's it's unbelievable. It's a huge waste of water. Thank you. Yep. And I think that's really important to think about, because if it's not going in the Kingston dump, should it go in someone else's dump? Right. To me, same, same. Um, I'm wondering, you mentioned on your slide that you take damaged, stained, singular shoes. Can yep. you tell us a little more about that, please? Yeah, sorry, I didn't get to it. Five minutes goes fast. Um, yeah, so it came up last time, a question around what, what we take. We take pretty much any clothing or textile that's not wet. So wet things are bad for us. They create mold and they make it tough. Even, I mean, almost no one can, can do anything with wet clothing. Um, so yeah, stained shirt, ripped jeans, single shoe, stained baby um, clothing, we take it all. And then as you go through the process, some things can't be reused. I mean, the ultimate goal is you take it, you look at it, you assess it and it can go right back on the shelf and someone will buy it. That's perfect. But a lot of stuff you can't do that. There's no market for a stained t-shirt. But those shirts can be ripped up and, and, and used in industrial rags. So there, there is, a, again, kind of a cascade of use of the clothing that goes from 100% reuse down to recycling. And then at some portion of it, just you can't, you can't salvage everything. So if you take 40,000 pounds of clothes in a truck, a certain percentage ends up having to go to landfill, but it's small. It's, I mean... It varies, again, depending on which channel you go into, but 10% sometimes, but that's 10% of 100% that was saved from landfill initially. So um, we're very excited about it. I mean, ultimately, you want to get to a day where nothing ends up in landfill. We're not, the technology isn't there yet, but it's getting closer. Thank you. Amila, one more question? Unfortunately, delegations, uh, Max, have two questions. No problem. Thank you. Um, Councillor Sanek. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, hi, thanks so much for your presentation. I just have two questions. One of them is, um, I know you're based in Trenton. What cities right now are you servicing with so, these bins? So we, we service right now from Kingston to Trenton to Coburn. We're up north, so we're in um, Madoc, Marmara, Cam uh, Campbellford, Havelock. We're kind of kind of a big square from almost Coburg, north to Seven, across Seven, and then down to Kingston. That's, that's kind of generally where we're, where we're at now. We're trying to expand. We're going east and west. Okay, we, thank you. So Kingston would be your biggest market then? Um. Um, it would be our biggest market today, but we're, we're, we're moving it. We're, we're entering another big market to the east as we speak. So, yeah. Okay, and then my second question is... Um, uh, um, I know that some cities that have this, they have um, two bins, like one with one organization and also a bin with another organization. If that's the way, you know, like this goes tonight with the RFI um, and whatnot, would, would you be uh, okay with that? Um, Having at our city facilities a bin on the property going to another organization as well. Yeah, we wouldn't be opposed to it. There are challenges of maintaining the bin. So there is there is the issue of trash overflow and, and contamination. Um, 
we have we considered it. We we talked to another group about it. We ultimately decided not to do it for that reason. So if our bins are monitored and picked up every day, and another bin wasn't, and there was a garbage accumulating, it just could get kind of messy, literally <laughs> messy in terms of trying to figure out who who does what. Um, I think we'd be um, better suited to have some separation, but just purely from a an operational logistics standpoint. But yeah, certainly something we would entertain. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Ostoff. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Patterson, and thanks for the presentation, Trevor. Um, so I, the questions I have, uh, I was, I guess I'm, it's the clarity I now have, the preamble, Mayor Patterson, is that I, I didn't understand. I thought your, the route that you, your, your company was taking was in that it, it was seeking textiles that other other um, thrift stores don't take. That's how I understood it, which is something that we want to uh, make a difference in our environment. We want to make sure it doesn't go to the landfill and that resonates with all of us. So, because um, I, I, so in some sense, uh, t can you tell us exactly how your uh, conversations then went with, because uh, two, two of the uh, area thrift stores were concerned about your presence here. And I was the one involved with uh, Council Amos and uh, wanted a deferral, and I really appreciate the city's work and your work in communicating uh, um, uh, with stakeholders. So what did you learn and what can you tell us in the, about that conversation? Yeah, so they were hour plus long conversations, but I'll try and pick the highlights. So one is that um, new entrants don't dramatically impact the day-to-day the -day donations. So when Value Village Talese comes in, it's not like the donations at the mission, which is up in the mission store, which is up in that area, plummets. There's a, there's a blip. But then, it, it, I, you know, I, I don't want to quote anybody, but I think it was described as not having a huge impact. So that, that was one of the big things, is that there is so much capacity for additional recycling. The, the current nonprofits are taking out a tiny slice of the donations that, of, the, of the textiles in the waste stream today. If you think about it as the pie, there's 15% of the pie that's going somewhere and 85% of the pie is going into the landfill. We want to go after the 85%. Um, that, I mean, that's just the honest truth. We, I won't measure success by saying we took 3% away from nonprofits, yay, it worked. I mean, what I want to see in one year, three years, five years, 10 years is that 85 drops to 50, drops to 30. We recognize that this is an interesting dynamic because we are entering an ecosystem with nonprofits and we want it to be a win-win. We don't want, we, the last thing we want is a nonprofit to be hurt. So we've actually said, and it's a collaboration, part of the pilot and it was in the proposal was, we want to learn, we want to get feedback. We're going to put our best foot forward and our best foot forward is we talked to two nonprofits that wanted completely different things. One nonprofit said, we want clothing during our slow season because we don't get enough. We're like, perfect. We can drop off a thousand pounds of clothing within, give us 24 hours notice, we can do it. The other nonprofit said, we have lots of clothing, we need cash. And we said, that's great. We, we, uh, the original proposal was to set up a fund as a percentage of the clothing that's collected and we would allocate that, that money out in a cash. We didn't even consider the clothing, clothing donation initially. When we came in July, that wasn't even on our radar. So we kind of learned that as we went. Um, I'll leave one last comment. I think the interesting thing is they want to work and figure this out. I think initially we look like a threat, but I think through the conversations and when you understand that this is an environmental problem we're solving, not a um, compete with don charitable donations problem, there's a willingness and kind of an openness to figure it out. And so what we would do is we would collaborate. I mean, I would bring together the nonprofits in a, maybe once or twice throughout the session and say, how's it going? Like, did you see an impact? We also committed not to put bins anywhere near any of the nonprofits, so we're not gonna, and we worked with, um, with the administration staff to map out where those could be, and there were a couple locations that were touching, getting a little close, we kind of moved those away. So at the end of the day, this only works if the nonprofit community benefits. The, the residents benefit from far more convenience, the environment benefits, and the economy benefits. So it's really win-win-win across the board. The only person who loses is the person who owns the dump. Right. I mean, that's, I, that, that's, that's helpful. <laughs> and the second phase of that, so you're saying too then in that relationship with um, the existing eight other uh, thrift stores is that if things that they can't move, then they also could get that product to you and keep it out of the landfills. And that's really... So initially, no. 
So initially, we can't, right now, we don't have the capability to take, it's getting into the industry jargon, but credentialed clothing is unsorted. The clothing that comes from a thrift store that can't be sold is considered not credentialed, and that can't be, that can't be put into other thrift stores. It's kind of been picked over already, so it almost always goes to industrial rags or industrial uses. There are other companies that, that do that today already on scale. So that's not, we wouldn't take the unsellable stuff from the thrift stores today. We may eventually get into that, but initially that's not the business we can service today. But we could provide the nonprofits with credentialed unsorted clothing, just like you drop off a bag of clothes, we'll drop off 100 bags of clothes. Thank you. Okay, uh, next is Councilor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Uh, thank you for the presentation and the, uh, answering the questions. Trevor, what's your background? How did you get into the uh, textile recycling uh, business? What, what, what brought you here? What's your... Yeah, so I've got a pretty varied background in different industries, but probably the most salient one is I started a company called Frogbox in Vancouver. And Frogbox was a sustainability-focused company trying to green bring sustainability to the moving industry. So we created a company that used recyclable, um, not recyclable, reusable plastic moving boxes to replace cardboard. Um, we started that 14 years ago in Vancouver. We were on Dragon's Den. We got funded by, yep, if you I saw I recognize yep. you. Yep. Yeah. So okay. we were on Dragon's Den. So we expanded yeah. <laughs> to 20, we're in about 20 cities uh, in the U.S. and in Canada, and we're diverting millions of cardboard boxes, preventing millions of cardboard boxes. So I had a kind of an interest in leaving the world a better place for my kids than I found it. And when I saw the 85% of textiles, and I saw my teenage daughter going to the thrift store, like when I was a kid, no one went to, the, I, I'm gonna make a general I was, but I didn't go to the thrift store when I was a kid. That was, you just didn't do that. My daughter and her friends go to the thrift store as a like, instead of going to the movies, and the, the, I was, the connections came. 85% still in landfill. My kids are going to thrift stores. I'm like, there's a solution here. We gotta figure it out. And as I read more, I mean, it's atrocious. The working conditions of the garment industry, the water, the pollution, and the emissions, it's 150 billion garments a year are made across the globe. And the average um, clothing is worn less than seven times. It's just, it, it, it's a problem that needs solving, and so I decided to tackle it. I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah. Thank you. It does. Yeah. I thought I recognized you from somewhere, yeah. and I realized it's Dragon and Dragon's Den. So, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, Councillor Glenn. Uh, through you, thank you for the presentation. Uh, it was very thorough. I, I think where I'd like to take my question, though, is: Can you explain how you differ from the nonprofits? So, right now we have a multitude of nonprofits. They have collection boxes out. So, what is it that you're going to be doing differently? to catch that other stuff that's not making it into their boxes? So scale. So people, consumers are lazy by nature. And if you have to pack your clothes up and drive, I'm going to make up a number, 12 blocks instead of two, you're more likely to throw it in the trash. So we know from examples of other communities that have done this, the primary driver is not wanting to do good for the environment, it's not wanting to be charitable, it's lazy. I put it in my car, I drive around with it for a week, I didn't pass a bin, I throw it in the trash because I gotta put my kids in the back seat and I don't wanna take it back in. That's the reality of it. This game is won, I shouldn't say game, it's not a game. This is won by making it stupid easy for residents to put these to put the stuff in the bin. If there's one everywhere across the city and you can, you know where they are, there's one at your kid's school, there's one at your church, there's one at your Tim Hortons, you're gonna put the stuff in. We just have to lower the hurdle. And we've got all kinds of ideas to do other stuff. We've got ideas for doing it on corporate campuses. We're in, we're in, we're in one of the schools here. We just got a call today from a local church that wants to put in. We're doing fundraising for the schools, fundraising for the churches. We want to get them out there so that people put them in. We don't want to say we're the better bin. We just want people to do it to make it easy. And that's, that's a hypothesis. And it's been proven in a couple communities in Canada and a couple in the US that density matters. That's the, way, that's the only way you can get people to really recycle and reuse clothing. Uh, thank you. I'd say I agree with you. Um, <laughs> how many people do you anticipate employing? So for the pilot, probably two. Um, 
it's not huge. I mean, it's the pilot is a pilot. We don't want to hire a whole bunch of people and set up a warehouse and do all of that just to find out that it doesn't work long term. So we would probably hire two, um, two drivers, um, and they would be responsible for going to the bins. When I say servicing, it means emptying the clothes, cleaning them, making sure the locks are in good condition, making sure they're free of debris, making sure the sensors are working, keeping them professional and, and um, functional. So, but over time, it could grow. I mean, if we were as successful in Kingston as Markham has been, it could be four or five times that. Councillor Sun. Thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, I just I have one question. Um, correct me if I did not hear well. Um, you will collect all kind of clothes, mm -hmm. but as you mentioned, the some of you will reuse them to resell it some nationally, some internationally. Yep. What happened to those those, uh, those clothes which is not re usable? They are damaged, or you mentioned also stain. What are you going to do with that? So, so, so that if the clothing is unusable from a reuse standpoint, point, meaning it's not believed that it's sellable, then it either then it gets recycled and either put into some other use. So, some people it can be insulation, it can be wet, uh, rags, industrial rags. There's different uses for different fi uh, fibers. Some fibers can't be reused. Like if you get some, some polyester, some synthetic fibers, if they're damaged, there is no reuse. There's no technology, there's no way to use it. If cottons are stained, they can be reused. So, it, so basically they go through all of the clothes and they pick out the most likely to be re reused, sold into the circular economy. What's left over is then decided if there's an industrial use or not, and then a, some small portion of it then is deemed to not have circular use and, and then is, is um, put into the landfill. We've talked about, um, we've actually approached the incinerator in, um, um, I can't remember, in east of here, towards Toronto, about potentially using them for energy creation, but we haven't quite figured that out yet. And how you will choose the which uh, nonprofit organization you will support it um, financially or you will give them to some money? We want how to open, we want to open it up to all of them. So we would plan to approach all of them and say, here's what we want to do. I mean, we have to gauge the interest. If all of them are interested, then we'll look at it. If one is interested, it may be a different program. So part of the pilot is to approach them and find out what they need and what they want. Uh, again, I was surprised at, at the mix, um, but everybody would be eligible. Um, I can't tell you we've kind of got a formula figured out because we want to see who's interested and then we'll, we'll adapt accordingly. And we'd look for feedback from you and the, I mean, we're looking for feedback to make this work. Councilor McLaren. Thank you, I was just asked to ask, um, we know you have South American contacts and stuff like that. Is there um, a local sales outlet or anything like that or are you entirely going to other charities as well? We don't have anything in Kingston yet because we don't have a presence. So we kind of have to get the supply first and then we approach the local uh, community to find uh, where we can place the clothing. So it's it's based on a where, I mean, what we don't want to do is be driving the clothing all over the place. It's just not good from a carbon footprint. So kind of the cart before the horse is once we have a presence in a community, then we, or, I mean, we can preempt it a little bit, but we then approach um, potential buyers in a, in a local community and, and build that relationship kind of piece by piece. Thank you. Yep. Kaiser Chase. Thank you. Um, first, I just want to expand on the Councillor Oosterhoff's um, scenario there. So it, you may, we won't be taking any clothing from the nonprofits, but if they decide they want to just put some into your bins, then you'd be taking them, correct? Yeah. Okay. I mean, we don't police it. I mean, it's yeah. we take whatever whatever's there. Okay. And I know that five minutes is pretty quick. I was just wondering within your presentation, because I know we only saw a couple slides, was there anything in your presentation that maybe we should know in order to make a, an informed decision that we haven't asked at this point? Um, I mean, I think the two things that I didn't get to kind of ran out of time was 
you know, we see it as a win-win-win. I mean, I touched on it, but I really do think through this, the economy wins, the residents win, the nonprofits win, and the climate and the environment wins. And we see it as urgent. I think there's a general problem with environmental solutions is it seemed to be like, I, we've got all this time, right? The environment doesn't move quickly, it's moving. Like, we gotta do something quickly. Like, I wake up every day trying to figure out how do we scale this in and make a real dent in this, because I mean, I just read the news and I try and filter out the sensationalism, but I look at the data. I mean, if you see the data from this year, the number, no, hot, the most number of record days by a long shot. I mean, if you look at the graph, it's, we're getting into weird outliers. Um, there's an urgency to do this, and I, I mean, Kingston has taken a position as a city to lead in environmental issues, and I think that's why we're excited to work with you. I think we're just scratching the surface. I mean, I would hope to be back in front of you in one year, three years, five years, with lots of other innovative ways to do this. Um, but we got to get these textiles, 85%. And I don't think it's quite that high in Kingston. I, I, that's a general number. I actually think Kingston's a little better than average. But we got to, it's nowhere near, I mean, it should be 5%. It's, it should feel as bad throwing a t-shirt out as it does a plastic water bottle. I mean, you should have that same guilt when you drop it in the garbage as you do. I mean, we're not there yet. People don't think of it as bad, and they should. Thank you. Okay. I seeing no other questions. Mr. McCall, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'll move to our second delegation this evening. We'll invite Simon Langer from Diabetes Canada, who will appear before Council to speak to Deferred Motion 1 and Clause 1 of Report Number 77 from the CAO with respects to textile recycling. I'm a bit shorter. Okay. Dear Mayor Patterson and respected members of Council, <clears throat> as noted, uh, my name is Simon Langer. I am the National Manager of Government and Strategic Partnerships at Diabetes Canada. I'm here to request formally the City of Kingston's participation in Diabetes Canada and York University's national study on textile waste diversion. This is the first study in Canada that's identifying the economic, environmental, and social impacts of textile diversion for municipalities, a study that is now in its seventh year. Your municipality's participation in this study is vital as our findings will continue to be used to inform new legislation, such as EPR studies, et cetera, regarding the management of used textiles in the city of Kingston and as well as across the country. We firmly believe that the city of Kingston and Diabetes Canada can mutually benefit from a formal partnership. At present, it is estimated that well more than one million kilograms of used textiles are being generated by households in Kingston ongoing yearly. This is not only represents a significant material that's being sent to landfill, as mentioned, 85% of used textiles presently goes to landfill. Those statistics uh, actually come from Dr. Calvin Lackin, who's a part of this study initiative. But it is also a missed opportunity to generate critical revenue for life-saving diabetes research, as well as to support your university and, and the city of Kingston in developing this compre comprehensive program. We like to just highlight the fact that 100% that 100, 100 million pounds of clothing that we collect on a yearly basis as the largest collector of used clothing in Canada, 95% uh, of that material is either reused and or repurposed. We want to identify the means and methods to support textile diversion through the placement of our textile recycling bins, perhaps, and in consultation with your staff and with yourselves at your community centers, public spaces, arenas, etc. Diabetes Canada is uniquely positioned as a recognized charitable, 100% charitable brand that has the collection and processing infrastructure with our partners to ensure that used textiles are being managed effectively and responsibly. York University has conduct, conducted numerous studies that have highlighted how imperative it is, I'd all like to highlight this point, that households want to recognize who the operator of the bin is. York University, not Simon Langer, refers to them as charity masqueraders. These are for-profit enterprises that resell textiles under the false pretenses that they're in fact a charitable operator. This actually, this is Dr. Calvin Lackin, quote, actually discourage household participation as households are unsure as to whether or not they are actually supporting a legitimate charitable organization. An important element of this is to have clothing bins that have municipal branding indicating that they are in fact an, an approved 100% charitable or not-for-profit 
partner. With that said, we have provided you all with our textile diversion pro proposal, which has been shared with staff, as well as a letter from York University directly requesting that the city participate in this important initiative. We also wanted to advise you that we currently have formal textile diversion programs with municipalities all across Ontario, as well as all across Canada, that I stood and many of your fellow councillors, elected officials in different regions supported. That includes the city of Markham, which was actually North America's first municipal textile diversion program in which all partners are 100% charitable entities. The town of Newmarket, Metrolinx, Peel Region, Aurora, the town of Stolville, the city of Stratford, the city of Windsor, King Township, and the list is quite extensive, but that gives you some examples. We're hoping that the city of Kingston will seriously consider agreeing to do the same. We can all work collaboratively, and I'd like to highlight again, collaboratively to drive our collective social and environmental impact. I would like to highlight the following. We are asking to do a pilot program. It would be our absolute, absolute pleasure to partner in any which way with all of the 100% charitable and not-for-profit organizations that reside in Kingston proper. We actually have existing relationships with many of them today, as well with their partner stores and locations all throughout the country. Should you decide to move forward to support the launch of this program, you will receive less garbage, increased diversion of the millions of kilograms of textiles going to landfill. 30 the seconds. The opportunity to showcase your important commitment to this environmental research and supporting your municipal's waste strategy, which supports reuse, repurposing, as well as the circular economy. You're also helping to support the 11 and a half million Canadians or one in three individuals in the city of Kingston who are impacted directly by diabetes or prediabetes. Thank you very much. I welcome your questions. Okay, thank you very much. Our questions, Councillor Chinani. Um, yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my first question would be, um, how much, so these cities that you mentioned that you participate in, how much is, what is the percentage that is going to the landfill that you know of? Um, five, approximately, this is all approximations, but approximately 5%. So from like the previous presentation, which represents 85% going to the landfill, so you have it down to 5%, is that what you're saying? So I can only speak on behalf of Diabetes Canada, but we collect 100 million pounds of textiles, of which 95 million pounds is either reused and or repurposed. Um, and 5% is landfill, which across the country is 5 million pounds. So in each context of each individual municipality, the average is 5% goes to landfill. Okay. Do you see that both, could, both of these pilots could work together in the same municipality? Um, uh, to divert more? <laughs> So out of respect to all parties, um, it, from our perspective in the shared research that I've brought forward, like we would be very happy and um, it would be our pleasure to participate and to uh, collaborate with any other nonprofit and or charitable organization that participates in the collection of used textiles. Uh, oh, I, th I think um, I would state only. Thanks. Okay, uh, Councillor Stephen. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, through you. Thanks for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, I have the same questions as I did for um, Renewal Squared. So first question is, uh, can you describe for us where your materials are shipped, please? Because as I mentioned before, GHG impact is really important to us. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you. It's a very important question. And I believe you did, um, you might have mentioned this earlier. So I, um, this is a somewhat of an involved question. So I'm gonna try to provide a complete answer as possible in the time constraints for this evening. I want to just also mention that if there's any um, unanswered questions tonight, I know that Dr. Calvin Lackin from York University would be his pleasure to, to answer anything else further. Uh, I do not have a PhD in, in this area. Um, <clears throat> so to answer your question, um, so the one thing I really want to highlight here is every year on average, we collect from, from our total collections around 25 million to 30 million pounds of our total collections is reused domestically in Canada. So that is the largest amount of reuse that takes place in the Canadian domestic market compared to any other collector. Um, and that, what that means is that those items are being reused in their current state, which is actually the most environmentally friendly option that is currently available. We wanna keep the products here as much as we possibly can. Most certainly uh, some aspects 
of our collections or um, a percentage of our collections are shipped overseas to other countries, that is no different than essentially almost any collector uh, in Canada. I want to be fair to, to everyone. Um, and quite frankly, that is because of the choices that we as Canadians, all of us included, uh, those are decisions that we make as consumers. Canadians can be quite uh, selective in terms of what they're willing to wear and not wear to keep in fashion. And then in addition to that, we also deal with the phenomena that I'm sure you're all um, aware of, which is fast fashion. And there's a lot of dollars, billions of dollars, in fact, spent by many leading retailers across Canada and across North America and across the world that try to entice us to behave in such a way. And so it's a combination of factors and it's a complicated, it's like, so, um, so the bottom line is in terms of any items that are shipped overseas, what's most critically important yeah, to those that are of us that are environmentalists and Dr. Lacken and others included is that we don't ship any of our products through our partners to any countries that have like textile bans as an example. Um, this is imperative in order to uh, follow chain of custody and to make sure that, you know, the products and the materials are being uh, managed in both a socially and environmentally responsible manner. Um, there might be questions that come up regarding Value Village, so I'd rather just cover that um, and be transparent. So Value Village is, a, um, is, a part, is not a partner, they're a customer of ours. That means that we sell material to them and they pay us a higher rate than we would be able to achieve ourselves. So if we were to sell those materials in the open market, we would be at a disadvantage, a significant disadvantage. And just this past year, the last two years, the average revenue generated net-net after all expenses is over $5 million. That supports Diabetes Canada, life-saving diabetes research, education, advocacy efforts, and helps us to send children to our diabetes decamp programs. So um, if there's any questions regarding that, I just wanted to clarify uh, that point. But when a, a donation is placed into our bin, that, one, that donation is 100% charitable and supporting Diabetes Canada. Does that answer your question? Oh, I actually, I, my apologies. One last point, which is um, diabetes, you had asked about emissions and how this supports your overall strategy as a municipality. This is so critically important, I'm sorry. Um, York University is a third party academic institution, so the Faculty of Environment and Urban Change will be providing the City of Kingston ongoing with the life cycle analysis of the materials that are being collected on a monthly basis. This is the exact same reporting that we provide to all of our municipal partners that I mentioned and many others, and I am fairly confident that all of them would be willing to share those details with you and to provide references accordingly. Um, so that includes GHG reductions and the equivalency of, and that LCA study uh, counselor also includes the shipping of the materials. So LCA is a complete, um, it gives you a 365 perspective, or 360 degree perspective um, of the collection. So it's not just about the collections that the place at the bin, it's the collections of the importation, exportation, and, and collection, et cetera, of the materials. Councillor Stephen? Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Um, thank you for that. And another question I wanted to ask you, so obviously you, you already talked about how reuse in its current form is the best way. Uh, what do you do if someone submits damage stained single shoes, what, what have you? We, we accept all the above. So we accept, I wrote it down because I did not want to make an error, but the, we accept all grades of textiles in a reusable condition just as long as they are not soiled and or contaminated. So that is the same terminology or similar to terminology that the city of Markham or our other municipal partners utilize. And that's the way we've always, we've always done this. So it's really, that's why these, these programs are so important because that we can educate the public. Councilor McLaren. <clears throat> Thank you. I get the impression you're not interested in working with a for-profit company. And I'm wondering why that is. Um, are you like in an existential crisis? Do you feel that they are not, they're going to take away your market share? Because what we heard from um, him was that he's going to take more of the wasted pie and recycle it, essentially. Um, the message I'm sensing from you is you don't want that to happen or you feel that that's not going to happen. What is your objection to allowing another participant in the market? That's an excellent question. So thank you very much, uh, Councillor. I appreciate that. So textile diversion efforts is a very unique opportunity for all of us collectively. Not only a unique opportunity for Diabetes Canada or 
for your residents. It's a unique opportunity for all of our communities collectively across the country in that when charities and not-for-profit organizations have the opportunity to collect those donations first, that allows us to not only drive and drive environmental impact, but also very significant social impact. So I'm not here to represent any of the other charities, but being in this industry myself for many years, I, we all have a very strong belief of that. And if one was to just take a, a perspective of what the research shows you, so like what do the experts, what, what are the leading um, research studies, what have they indicated to us in terms of behavior? What they have shown is that a, a couple of key points. Number one, people want to know that they are supporting 100% true charitable and not-for-profit organizations. Your residents, Canadians in general, do care if they are supporting a charity or not, and they want to know if, if it is a legitimate organization, that like 100% of those funds are charitable funds that are being supported. Also, people have a unique attachment to their clothes. Um, this is, again, a part of Dr. Lacken's research and study, and, and this is all Canadian research. And what he talks about, um, and I'm not going to be as eloquent as him, so my apologies for that. Um, but what he discusses in a lot of his research is how, um, you know, people build like an affinity to their clothes, an attachment to their clothes, and they want to know what the, what the social good is that, that, that comes from that. And in partnering with yourself, like as an example, I spoke about the LCA studies, there's also the social impact study as well. So we provide to you all as an example, the environmental impact, like the life cycle analysis, the amount of tons collected, the GHG reduction, but also like in terms of social, like how many children were you helped to send to our diabetes decamp for children that are impacted by type one diabetes. The other charitable partners, I don't want, I'm here certainly not to speak for them, but I'm certain that in a lot of their reports, they do something similar. And actually that information drives further participation, which even further drives further diversion. And that is the true definition of win-win, right? Where there's the social, environmental, and economic impact that can be fully realized and fully maximized. So it's not that I'm against anybody for having a sustainability lens or for wanting to build an organization or a company that that has uh, an interest in, in, in sustainability or, or waste aversion efforts, like I applaud that. But as a first step with, you know, Diabetes Canada and some very other reputable uh, charities that are out there, the ask is out of the 85% that's current going to landfill, that the charities get the first crack at that. And we believe that most Canadians would agree with that. And if we have the um, capabilities to provide that service to you at absolutely no cost, in addition to provide you data that's being overseen by a university, and also, lastly, that we're willing to uh, partner with other charities collectively, like we, it would be our absolute pleasure. By no means do we want to compete with the other charities. Um, yeah, those are some of the reasons that, that we have the position for which we, we held. Of course, the final decision rests with all of you, but those are some of the arguments that we feel are really important for you to consider. I think you may have misunderstood my question. I'm just wondering, do you feel that you're going to lose your market share if we let another competitor in? I feel that in the city of Kingston in particular, Diabetes Canada as a charity does not have very many donation bins based on your population currently. And so if you were to provide locations to other, other for-profit organizations, um, as opposed to our charity or another charity, then that's a lost opportunity, we believe, collectively for all of us, including Diabetes Canada, not exclusively Diabetes Canada. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is Councillor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship. Through you, I don't know why I raised my hand again. I think I'm just so used to it. Um, thank you for your presentation. A question you you mentioned during the presentation, and this is just point of clarification. When you said you have a proposal for the city, are you assuming we'll do our search? For, one of the motions is a request for proposals. Are you going to submit to the city or have you already submitted a proposal to the city for Di Diabetes Canada? Yeah, thank you, Councillor, for that question. I appreciate it. So I just wanted to provide some further insight as I did read the reports and restudied everything prior to coming here today. 
Diabetes Canada actually, it was myself who had reached out to the city in 2017 to see if there would be opportunities for us to uh, partner, at which time we, had, we were asked to uh, complete an RFI. It wasn't like an RFP, it was like a request for information for which we responded per, like formally. And then we had followed up again at some point, and the dates, this is somewhat fuzzy, especially pre-pandemic, but then we had responded in 2019. And then um, from there, the pandemic hit. And then based on my most recent conversations with staff, it was that, and this was my honest answer at the time until I started said, wait a minute, I think we've, we might have had some consultations previously. Um, we then discussed, we, we, you know, were looking to try to do it again, but then, you know, kind of sort of the pandemic, um, unfortunately, uh, impacted that. So this is our try again, once again. So the short answer is, uh, on top of all that, is that we have recently provided a formal proposal to staff just a few weeks back. We did have a formal meeting with some of your staff members in waste management, and we did um, yeah, share uh, all of those details. So... Um, so you have had a recent meeting with city staff? A few weeks back, yes. A more formal meeting, yes. Okay, thank you. No problem. Councilor Glenn. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. So my question is, my first question is, you indicated that this research has been going on for seven years. So I'm a little confused as to uh, why the research period has taken so long. Are you looking at a new question, and that's why you're proposing a pilot here. Um, and, you know, if you've been doing this for seven years, I understand the pandemic interrupted all of us, but why has it taken so long to get to us then, and you're now here at this moment? Okay, so, Councillor, I, I'm going to apologize if I didn't capture all of that, and if I missed something, apologies in advance. I'm going to try to attempt to answer your question, and please let me know what, what the gap is. So... Um, Number one, again, just I'm not sure, I don't want to reiterate what I just said, but we did come to the city in 2017 and we did provide a response through an RFI uh, with some hopes of partnering in some way in textile diversion efforts. And then we did um, send an email in 2019 again to follow up. Uh, in regards to the research, that research is not led by myself, Councillor. It's, but there's a gentleman named Dr. Kelvin Lackin who is the co uh, lead researcher, the um, the Waste Wiki project at the Faculty of Environmental Studies in, at York University. So this is an ongoing effort. The, the purpose of that um, research is not that there's like a specific end date. It's a collection of data which is ongoing, as I'm sure you're aware, like many provinces are currently looking at textiles in the future from an EPR perspective. There's lots of things that are currently happening in Europe and other parts of the world in terms of how they're setting up uh, EPR programs and legislation pertaining to textile waste. And in compared to some parts of Europe and other parts of the world, we're actually quite behind in, in those efforts. And so um, what we've been formulating is like overall data of the life cycle analysis of the materials that are being collected over larger, greater purposes of time, how those collections like change social economic factors within each region, and again, like, I don't want to speak out of turn because that research is not led by myself. And that's intentional, that if there's a third party that's involved. So that's why I had noted earlier that if there's further questions, that they're more research-based, then I would, you know, I know Dr. Lackin, would, it would be his pleasure to speak to you all. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it this evening. Does it, am I answering your questions? Uh, fairly well. I, um... I'm going to leave the research piece for now, uh, as I think it takes time to actually delve into what it is you're looking at and why. Um, my other question, though, has to do with the amount of textiles that need to be recycled. Uh, does Diabetes Canada actually believe that it would be able to handle all of the textile that needs to be recycled here in this city, along with the current nonprofits? Because uh, I'm quite concerned that there's enough of it that that's not possible. Yes. Yeah, so. The short-term answer is absolutely yes for the moment. I do not believe that overnight, and, and you know, these are even consultations that we have with provincial bodies and governments that talk to us about textile waste. I don't feel like it's in anyone's best interest that you just push a button and then overnight you 
literally are collecting billions of pounds of textiles. But the process here that we're asking for and the reason it's intentional that we use the word pilot is to drive tests, conduct studies, collect data, analyze that data and confirm that we can continue to grow and expand in a way that is responsible and beneficial to, to all parties. Now, with that said, Diabetes Canada does have an infrastructure in Kingston. We do have staff in Kingston. We are servicing our bins regularly in Kingston ongoing today. We do have the ability to service your bins up to seven days a week if we started tomorrow. Well, maybe not tomorrow, but in a few weeks time. We, um, so, you know, we do have the ability to do this and we have provided this service for the past many years to other municipalities. As an example, like in Markham, where it first started, we have 100 plus donation bins that are City of Markham branded bins in their municipality. And we run those services on a daily basis th throughout their um, region. Okay, next on my list is Councilor Stanek. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Mr. Blinker, for speaking to us tonight. Um, my question is just about the collection and the monitoring. So would the bins, if we have these bins at um, you know, city facilities, would they be monitored every day, or do you use electronic monitoring as well as the bins um, fill up? Okay. You all are asking excellent questions, and that one is included. So. Um, we have actually conducted studies. We have 4,000 donation bins across Canada. We have done individualized studies over the past many years of you know, how do we improve or increase uh, service uh, efficiency, productivity for employees, uh, et cetera. Um, what we have found thus far in our own learning is that utilizing certain types of technology have not actually been of net benefit to us. And the reason being is that in textile collection, most of the time, the issue is not whether or not the bin is full, the issue is about people placing items outside of the bin. So through that key learning, we have to service the bin every day regardless. And in many cases, in some cases, depending on site, which we term like strategic locations, we even have to service the bin multiple times per day. So um, we find that the bin just has to be serviced. Like, like that is the way that you provide ongoing um, uh, service that will keep uh, residents um, and uh, our partners and our, uh, our, our elected officials happy at the end of the day with, with you know, the services that we're uh, providing on, ongoing. So I, I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks very much. And then on your bins, do you have like Diabetes Canada, you know, like prominently um, uh, like written on, on your bin so everyone knows those bins are going to Diabetes Canada? Yes, absolutely, and I'm not sure if you all have had the opportunity uh, to review um, some of the details that have been shared with you all. Like, we do have a PowerPoint that I believe was shared. Um, sometimes I'm hesitant in utilizing it for my five minutes, but um, sometimes it works out, sometimes not as, not as great. Uh, but on, in that document, there is a picture of our donation bin. I wanted to reiterate that um, our bins um, have been reviewed by a third-party engineer, deeming them safe for public use. We are actually the leaders to work with a Canadian uh, manufacturer based in Ontario on developing that new bin type and style, for which was then shared with almost all municipal uh, associations across the country in each province. Um, and also, so that new bin style makes it extraordinarily difficult for people to pull items out, out of the bin because of the way they're designed. It's called a rolling chute. So a lot of companies previously were using a mailbox type, but um, they've now all been replaced for the most part with this new, in, this new tool or invention for which there is a metal um, wall that goes up and down a lever. And so it makes it very difficult for people to reach in and to remove items. And it also makes it virtually impossible for people to also get inside the bin. Also, all of our bins have $5 million of liability insurance for which we provide um, uh, an insurance certificate naming the city because um, you know your procurement and legal team will want that, and that is what we that's standard practice. And that five million dollars is usually pretty standard compared to some of the other waste collectors, because that's how we arrived at that number. So we compared ourselves to private waste collectors, um, and we provide you all with a service agreement contract as well, which will highlight all the expectations, so it's really clear as to what you all expect of us and that there's no misunderstanding or lack of clarity. We have not had one experience in the past many years of any municipality canceling a contract because we were not able to fulfill um, our responsibilities. 
Thank you. Okay, Councilor Shapes. Thank you, and thank you for your presentation. And I want to thank your organization for all your work to do with the world of diabetes. However, that's not why we're here today. We're here to talk about textile recycling. Thank you. Um, and you mentioned that you keep mentioning that you're a nonprofit organization. However, you deal with nonprofits. So, you want to explain that? I'm sorry, Councillor. Can you repeat? The well, question? you keep reiterating here over and over that you're a nonprofit organization, but you deal with profit, uh, for-profit organizations like Value Village. That that is correct. Yeah. So, Diabetes Canada is a 100% charitable, not-for-profit organization. Our textile collections are run through the National Diabetes Trust, which is a social enterprise where 100% of all net revenues go right back to Diabetes Canada's mission to end diabetes every year. So in mentioning Value Village, Value Village is a customer of ours, so no different than every other collector, every other reuse, um, thrift store, et cetera, at some level, if they have the capabilities, so not all collectors have the capabilities to collect the, necess like the volume that would necessitate the need um, for larger partners, but the majority of the charities that we're all most common with that have that type of infrastructure in some way do sell to a for-profit operator because they're selling you know, those, those unused materials. So the advantage of Diabetes Canada or other charities that partner with Value Village, and I'm not speaking on behalf of them, just for clarity, is that they pay Diabetes Canada a higher rate for the materials that we're collecting than we would get in the open market. Even with our 100 million pounds of collections and the volume that we have, there's no other place that we could go that would give us more money. So that, in that way, that's how we drive our social impact. So I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I'm trying. So if I'm missing a gap, Councillor, please advise, and it's my pleasure to try again. No, <clears throat> pretty much what I expected. Um, you also mentioned the money which goes towards research, 100%, but you are a very large organization, you're, you're national, so Correct. you have a large executive team. And according to your website, about 25% of your revenues goes towards salaries and management. So I'm just wondering, how much does your CEO make? I'm sorry, what percent did you mention, sir? I'm just wondering how much your CEO makes. So Cause, cause we're not a public organization and similar to all charities like that are in our space, that's not a typical thing that is disclosed. So that's not a Diabetes Canada response. That's almost all major health charities in Canada or major employers in Canada, unless they're like a public organization. Yeah, I, you know, they, I, think, I, think we'll steer away, I think we'll steer away from that question, Councillor Chase. Um, any other questions from Council? Deputy Mayor Osteroff. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Patterson. So I, I know this is taking a long time, but it's hard to get a handle on it. So what does collaboration look like for others than other than Value Village with the, the local charity um, uh, thrift stores? What does that look like? Are you able to say that they all the stuff that you collect stays as much as possible amongst all the eight or nine um, thrift stores? You, you have a relationship with them all and distribute clothing and goods? Yeah, so I don't want to misspeak, because uh, if I did, it would be accidental, but I will say that in general, we have relationships with many of the charities for which I'm familiar with in Kingston. So if that relationship is in Kingston proper, I, I believe there are some examples that we do have those existing relationships. I'm not sure if it's with each of all, if it's with all of them. It's not uncommon for Diabetes Canada to partner with those organizations because in many cases, we actually um, assist them to capture the collections for which are no longer, um, like is not providing any, uh, is not supporting them in any way. So they have like overture is a term that we use. So it's materials that they're not able to sell through their thrift operation. And then it's like, what do we do with it? So then, uh, you know, in, in those examples, Diabetes Canada is willing, is able to partner with them and it's mutually beneficial and it helps both charitable organizations. So that's a win-win and uh, it's our pleasure to do that. Um, outside of that though, I just, I would like to go back to data because I, I think that's our friend. So the data shows us that there's literally millions of pounds of textiles that are going to landfill in Kingston every year. It's happening. Your own audit had, I believe, uh, averaged like four and a half percent or something like that. 
So bottom line is there's lots and lots and lots and lots of opportunity for all the charitable organizations that are currently in Kingston to collect that material, including ourselves. And so the way I'm gonna to try to ask you all to think about this as well is that we're not asking to take away anything from them. We're not trying to take a piece of their pie. We're looking to see and look for opportunities to expand our own uh, program here as if you were to compare the amount of bins that we have here in comparison to other municipalities of similar size in other parts of the country or in the province, we have many more. So in fact, in, in almost all of those examples, these same thrift stores or thrift shop operators do have locations. So I've never encountered a circumstance where someone has reached out to me and indicated that that us placing, let's say, five bins in a pilot program would have a significant impact on any which one of them. Um, but again, I want to reiterate the fact that it's our pleasure to collaborate with them. So, like, I had provided some examples to staff on how I thought that could go, so I will share one with you as just one example. We're not asking for an exclusive relationship. I want to just clarify that. So if there are 20 locations that you all see fit, meaning yourselves and your staff, et cetera, that there are 20 sites that we want to do a textile diversion program. We're asking to do a pilot with five. If other parties are interested in participating, can provide the necessary collection uh, and can provide the evidence that they can support this initiative in the way that you all require, by no means will we have any issue with that whatsoever. We just hope that you all will consider partnering with charities and nonprofits first. And I just want to really emphasize that. So, if there's something that we can do to support them, then we're willing to, to have that dialogue and that conversation. Like, that's what social innovation is. That's how meeting of the minds work. And um, one other thing I just wanted to also state, uh, Councillor, my apologies if I'm going over, but is that um, we don't believe that the best way to do that necessarily is through like an RFP process that actually puts charities in a position where they have to compete with one another. I, I would much rather prefer, our organization would much rather prefer for the opportunity again I know I'm being really repetitive to provide a pilot, provide data from York University. I'm sure that York would be open to discussions with you all. If, like Dr. Lackin, you all don't know him, but he's a pretty open guy. He's doing this for the right reasons. His interest in this initiative is not because he's trying to, uh, you know, create a monopoly. We're trying to uh, expand our, our 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 social and environmental good. So that's what this is all about. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay. Mr. Langer, thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. We will move to our third and final delegation this evening. Uh, we'll invite Rachel Dornenkamp from the Inclusive Play Project to speak to Council with respect to Clause 1, Report Number 79, received from the Municipal Accessibility Advisory Committee. My name is Sarah, and today, together with Rachel, we're here to speak to you about the Inclusive Play Project. We thank you for this opportunity. The Inclusive Play Project is a group of passionate community members who are working towards building a fully inclusive playground here in Kingston. Research has consistently shown the importance of play for children's social, emotional, and physical well-being. Despite this, most playgrounds are designed with able-bodied children in mind and don't often consider caregivers or children who may also have a disability or use a mobility aid. An accessible playground is not synonymous with an inclusive playground. An inclusive playground is accessible, but also includes lots of classic features um, from playgrounds for able-bodied children as well. An inclusive playground welcomes children and families of all abilities to play and grow together. One of the questions that we people often ask is, doesn't Kingston already have an inclusive playground? And while there are many great parks, several of which have accessibility features, we still have further to go. And Rachel's going to speak to us about that. 
So this is just a quick excerpt from the accessibility page on the City of Kingston website, um, which talks about how um, you know extra accessible features can be found at the following parks. Um, and just to reiterate, we took some um, of our clients that went and actually took photos at the park. So here's a picture of City Park, just to give you an example. There is a nice ramp on the side, which unfortunately doesn't really lead to anything, um, and it's wood chipped, as most of our parks are. Um, I understand that wood chips currently meet accessibility standards, but if you've ever tried pushing a wheelchair, across with chips, it's incredibly difficult, if not impossible. Here's another park, Memorial Center, you know, lots going on there, great rubber surface, um, but as you can see by one of our clients here, none of the structures are actually accessible, so they're not able to play on them. Most of the accessible features require transfers. Um, if you're over 40 pounds or use a power wheelchair, um, difficult, if not impossible. Rotary Park, beautiful ramp, um, unfortunately leads straight to a set of stairs. Lake Ontario Park, a favorite for families, beautiful rubber surface. Um, unfortunately, again, none of the actual structures themselves are accessible. You can see here our client, um, you know, there's kids playing to the left, but she can't actually get on and has to park her wheelchair beside it. Also, bucket swings are considered accessible if you're a small child, um, but if you're over 40 pounds, again, transferring someone into a swing that is moving, or if you have low tone or just kind of core support, it's, it's almost impossible. Last one on the list is Wellborn Park. Some great accessible features that have been added to the park. However, again, with the wood chips, um, our clients weren't even able to even wheel up to the actual features. So I just threw in here a picture of what an inclusive park actually looks like, and this is an example of a park from the States. As you can see, the entire thing is rubberized, so if you use wheels, you can access any part of this playground. The entire thing you can get to by a ramp, um, so there's lots of different sensory panels all throughout as well, geared at kids with autism or other kids that might have those needs. Um, if you're a caregiver going to the park with your children, you can also access the entire playground. And then also some inclusive features all throughout that kids who are able-bodied can use, so that everybody's able to play alongside each other. This is just a list of some other municipalities that are currently putting these parks into place. Um, and again, I specify that this is inclusive and not just accessible. Um, and you know, when we talk about this project, yes, we want to build a park, but a big part of this for us is educating around inclusive play. The Inclusive Play Project has taken the first steps to bringing to light the marginalization of those with disabilities within our community's access to play. While the city has made several attempts to increase the accessibility of publicly funded playgrounds, they have yet to truly become the inclusive spaces that our community desires and deserves. The City of Kingston website recognizes that people are our community's most valuable asset and that Kingston works to prevent and remove barriers for persons with disabilities on city property. We call upon the city to act upon these statements and to provide a playground that will allow all citizens to interact, play together, and thrive, which exceeds the basic standards of accessibility. We also have included, we have a website, Facebook page, and email address that if you would like to check out, we would encourage you to do so as well. Okay, thank you both very much. Are there any questions from Council? Uh, Deputy Mayor Ostroff. Can I defer to the other questions? Or do I start? I, I'll, whatever. Thank you for your presentation. We've been looking forward to this. A um, couple of us have been involved a little bit, and I think you're doing a tremendously great thing, and I'm sure it's going to be unanimous support for you. But do you already have a bank account set up? Is fundraising um, what the biggest deal is here? And the second question, Mayor Patterson, is related to have you already picked out locations, and has the city worked closely with you already, and what does that look like? Yes. So um, the feedback kind of from city staff has been incredible. Um, I have been so um, in awe kind of, I guess, on just the openness to being educated about this and also just the how can we help side of things. Um, so we are in the process um, 
Desiree is putting together a Canada Helps um, link for us, as well as a place for people to donate via e-transfer, which we are going to link to our website. Um, and we are hoping after this meeting, um, once you know we um, are told about the approvals to launch that fundraising campaign, we've been working very hard behind the scenes to get that ready. Um, and we have a whole committee of people, um, as Sarah said at the beginning, parents, teachers, people on the board, um, kids inclusive staff. We just recently partnered with Extend a Family Kingston who are gonna help us with some grant writing because we needed access to their charity number. Um, so we have been working very hard to get this moving. We have been given the location of Shannon Park, um, which is in the Rideau Heights district. Um, we're excited about that for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, it's one of the few parks that's actually very closely accessible to a um, accessible bathroom with an adult size change table and lift, which was the number one request mm. that kind of came out when we did our surveys around what families were looking for, um, because that lets people stay at the park, um, super important. The other thing, it's close to the 401, so if people are coming into Kingston for appointments from Brockville and um, from Belleville and Gann, as they do, to come into our hospitals and to Kids Inclusive, they have a spot where they can stop on the way home with their kids and play. Um, and it's also on a bus route. Um, so there's lots of great kind of community partners that are already involved there. And it has some accessible features there already, so we're able to just kind of expand onto the park that's there and just make it even better. Thank you, well done. Thank you, Councillor Sanek. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, those answers to those questions just answered my questions, which was, um, like, I think Shannon Park is an excellent uh, location. I was just gonna ask, you know, like, what, what you think makes it such an excellent location. You just explained that very thoroughly, and also about um, if you would be um, um, able to apply for grant money if you're qualified uh, for that, and you just answered that question too. So thank you, and uh, all the best with this project in whatever way um, Council can support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Excellent presentation. Um, can you just tell us a bit more about what the community response has been so far? Sure. So, um, as you can imagine, it's been pretty great. Um, we have really taken this inclusive piece to heart in that we have approached whoever we can. So we've gone to extend a family, we've gotten feedback on um, blind low vision, we've got feedback on you know senior populations who might have clients with dementia who would use this park. We've talked to um, parents who are mobility users. Sarah and I did a presentation to Spinal Cord Injury Ontario. We have gone to every kind of organization we think that would have clientele that would benefit from this park to make sure that it's being as inclusive as possible. And I did mention earlier, you know, when we first started this journey, it was about building a park and somewhere where we could send our clients or take our clients, but it is very quickly becoming more than that, and it's very quickly becoming this education around inclusive play. Sarah and I have been in this industry for a very long time, and we are learning every step along this journey about how little we actually knew about what truly inclusive play looks like, and if we could kind of let Kingston get on that bandwagon and then be a bit of a showpiece for other communities around, as some of the ones a little further away from us have, that would be super exciting, because I think many, many people could benefit from a play space like this. Thank you. Um, what have been the feedback from other municipalities who have already built uh, these parks? From other municipalities? Yeah. Um, we have spoken with some other municipalities and the feedback that we have received has been really quite um, remarkable. One of, uh, one of the municipalities was in the Niagara region, St. Catharines, and they have done the same thing where you started with one park and have now looked upon all of their future parks are going to be built with this in mind. So our, our hope is to kind of take notice of what's happening in other, other areas and to know that Kingston is on board with, with the changing ways um, and the feedback that we have received from other municipalities and other residents has all been positive. We haven't had any negative um, feedback at all. And Thank I think, you. Sorry to just add to that quickly. Um, one of the pieces is that the other municipalities understand that to retrofit all of their parks to something like this is extremely expensive. But what they have done is they've found tangible ways so that when they do retrofit a park or build a new park, those basic accessibility standards have just been elevated slightly so that there's more inclusive play options that kind of go above and beyond those basic accessibility standards. Excellent, great work. 
Thank you. Councillor Glenn. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you. This was a great presentation, and I'm absolutely thrilled that you're bringing this. Uh, as an ergonomist, I understand the complexity of universal design, so you're taking on a very massive task. Um, so I guess my question is probably for something that's further down the line, you're in those initial phases. But when you look at um, bringing someone to design this, um, who are you giving consideration to consulting with? Because I think it's challenging to get all of the elements you might be looking for. So we have two companies that are currently helping us. Both are Canadian-based, Playground Planners and ABC Recreation. Both specialize in inclusive parks and playground design. Um, and we have a couple things that we're working out just around design, but one of the companies is actually linked with a not-for-profit in the States called Unlimited Play. And they've been in business for over 20 years and they only build inclusive parks. And they have a whole education program that comes with signing on with them. So there's all sorts of great resources and we're just kind of working through the design process right now because we understand it'll kind of morph as we go along but we really want to get it right and kind of touch on as many pieces of inclusion as we can in in one spot and i don't know if you were able to see that recently in barry they have a brand new park that has been built that's inclusive and we have the opportunity to go next week mm -hmm. to an education um, event and to see the park and to talk to the people who've built it and to see the kinds of things that you know what worked well what didn't all those sorts of things so we've really been able to connect with some other people who've been there done that um, and to kind of help us along the way as well thank you uh, that's really good to hear that you're doing some of that testing because I think that's going to be a key element as you get into building is to continue to do some of that trial and error stuff before you finalize everything so thank you for bringing this forward I think it's great okay seeing no other questions thank you both very much uh, so with that, that takes us to the end of our delegations this evening, so we will move on to briefings. Uh, we have one briefing this evening. Uh, we'll invite uh, Acting Chief of Police Scott Fraser, Scarlett Isles, Director of Finance, and Jared Stearns, Board Chair from the Kingston Police Services Board, to brief Council on Information Report Number 3 with respect to the Quarterly Report, Kingston Police Services Board Operating Budget Status as at June 30th, 2023. Uh, so welcome, and uh, Acting Chief Fraser, I will hand things over to you. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and I take it I'm coming in okay? Yes, we can hear you, hear you fine. Okay, perfect. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to, uh, uh, this is our first meeting where we're introducing uh, Scarlett Isles, who uh, came to us from the city. Uh, John Howes, who's done a tremendous job for us, uh, has retired, and as I say, built a great foundation for which now uh, Scarlett can build a house for us. So, so we move forward. Uh, uh, we really appreciate, we're, we apologize for stealing her from the city, but we're happy to have her over at the police and still part of the city. Um, I think you'll also notice here today, we have a few of our uh, members here, um, more importantly, our senior management team. And I think it's important. To, we've we've kind of taken a new step in the budgeting process and uh, finance side. Uh, we have Inspector Lillian Murdoch, who runs our patrol section, Inspector Brian Pete, who runs our criminal investigations division, Inspector Greg Sands, who uh, runs our administration side of the house, uh, Sonia Verbeek, who's our director of human resources, and uh, we, of course, have our acting deputy chief, Matt Funnel, who's online and uh, at another meeting. And I apologize because I'm out of town uh, today at uh, meetings as well. Um, and also our board chair, Jared Stearns, I believe, is there. Um, and I'm not sure. I was hoping our IT uh, director could make it, Tim, and our uh, records manager, John. But I'm not sure if they made it or not. And I can't see everything there. So um, I just wanted to let uh, council know this is the group of people that is uh, uh, working uh, diligently in our organization uh, when it comes to finances and working diligently with Scarlett now uh, that she's taken the helm. And uh, I think we're, uh, for us, we're, we're in very good hands and it's a great team. And I think it's real important to, to understand that uh, this crew's working hard. Uh, you have the report and, uh, you know, I know everybody's had an opportunity to review it, um, certainly for us. Operationally, uh, like I said, we're coming in uh, exactly where we want to be. We're uh, we're doing things and uh, ensuring that we're uh, uh, squeezing every dollar that we can everywhere we can. Um, as I will say at every meeting, um, unfortunately, uh, what we have at uh, our, our liability is uh, is Queens, 
uh, or post-secondary institutions. Let's go that route and uh, the events that go go that way. So um, literally, uh, as we uh, work through our budget this year, um, we're meeting frequently. We're sitting down. We're going through. We're looking where we can make savings. Uh, we're ensuring that the dollars we spend are valuable. Um, and, uh, you know, I can't applaud the team enough. It's uh, been a, a bit of a change this year to all of them. And uh, so I really applaud them for that. So um, I, I imagine there may be questions, uh, more than one, I'm probably uh, uh, estimating. But um, at the end of the day, I think it's just important that, uh, that uh, you know, everyone understands what we're trying to accomplish here. Operationally, like I said, it's it's going very well. Um, you know, I had a, an interview with the media today where, you know, obviously it's showing a deficit there, but we all know that there's uh, different uh, timing uh, issues that go along with our budget and uh, payments. And we had a lot of upfront costs this year related mainly to IT. And uh, that was because we had, a, a you know, some critical infrastructure that needed to be updated as, uh, as, um, as it happens uh, in policing all over and in many other organizations. So um, I don't want to belabor it. I know you have a, a heavy agenda today. I just want to come and say we're, we're tracking, uh, tracking well. And, uh, of course, we all know that uh, post-secondary uh, institution stuff is going to be our biggest issue as we go into the third and fourth quarter. And I can just assure you that we're doing everything we can to squeeze every dollar without impacting public safety and without jeopardizing anything organizationally. We're just trying to find ways to offset the costs that we have to incur because we don't have the ability to um, to really uh, ignore it. And I think, uh, you know, obviously you've read in the newspaper about what we've come out with a new enforcement strategy uh, this year. Uh, which we hadn't done in the past. And, uh, you know, when we look at uh, last year and, and and see that we issued 44 tickets and we look at this year and we're well over 600 tickets now, um, obviously there's some issues and we need to address those. And that's what our, our that's what we're doing. Uh, we have our liaison teams out working uh, to try and minimize the impact there and let people know what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. And then we have our enforcement teams that follow up on that. So, um, you know, um, I, I know there'll be some questions, so I'm happy to answer them. And uh, like I said, we have our team here who's happy to step up as well. So, uh, Your Worship, I'll pass it back to you um, and go from there. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Questions from Council. Councillor Glenn. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and through you. So this is Councillor Glenn from Sydenham. So given that the conversation already seems to be revolving around post-secondary in Queens, uh, I think we'll just address it head on. Um, I've already expressed that I um, am hopeful to see the budget in the future actually include the costs of policing post-secondary because I think to have them outside of the budget um, sets us up for uh, ongoing deficits because we haven't taken a good look at it. Uh, so could you please give me a bit of um, understanding as to what those costs have looked like so far um, and also a, a comment on the July 1st weekend where we saw an unexpected um, partying happening in the district, which we were unprepared for. And I have a, a follow-up question after that. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, so um, like I said, I started, uh, I took over as acting chief on January 1st. And uh, yeah, there was no money in the budget prior. I can tell you I'm working on the 2024 budget and there is money in that budget. Uh, for sure. <laughs> so uh, you'll see it in the next budget. Um, but uh, obviously, yeah, there was there wasn't any in and and I think it goes back to a council before you and we've discussed this before. There was reason for it. I can't explain them. I wasn't here. However, uh, at the end of the day, moving forward, those costs are built into the budget and uh, should have had it been me. Like I said, I may have uh, included those, but like I said, I don't want to say too much because I wasn't part of the previous council and the conversations that took place. So um, I certainly don't want to overstep uh, uh, my welcome there because I just don't know. Uh, but moving forward, there will be. Uh, the Canada Day weekend, I believe you're referring to, is that uh, what you said in regards to July 1st? Yes. Okay, and, you know, uh, certainly for me, there's... Uh, 
there's been a number of events. Um, so um, at the end of the day, uh, Canada Day, I understand there's there's a number of events that take place throughout our community, and we respond accordingly uh, when we can. But um, obviously, um, uh, I, I, if you have a specific location uh, 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 in relation to what you're, I just uh, right now at this point, I, I'm not sure what you're speaking of. Um, so I'm speaking of um, Earl Avenue, Aberdeen. Uh, there were there was significant partying down there that weekend, and you know, none of us I think were prepared for it. It was a new uh, phenomenon. But I I was looking for uh, have you given consideration for that as you're moving forward because this is this was a unique thing. Just as we saw a few years ago, Boco became a new uh, but unique pressure on uh, the district and on on policing. Oh yeah, for sure, and and thanks for the clarification on that. Of course, and uh, um, like I said, uh, you know, uh, the post secondary institutions provide a number of unique uh, uh, weekends and things that happen. Uh, move in weekend this year, fifty five hundred students took the street. Uh, last year they didn't. Um, you know, we laid uh, three hundred and fifty tickets in the first weekend compared to, you know, less than forty, the previous year. Um, you know, the second move in weekend, just as many, um, third move in weekend, um, last year, it wasn't anywhere similar. So I guess at the end of the day, it's, it's, you know, we're being asked, you know, obviously to control our costs, yet we have a number of events that, uh, come up and, and, and oftentimes we use our intelligence to try and, uh, ascertain what the events are, where they're going to be. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, these things happen, and and year after year, unless we want to really staff, uh, you know, uh, up staff every single weekend, um, which of course comes with a extra cost because we still have to police the rest of the city, and uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's very difficult. But what we do when those calls come in, we certainly respond to those calls accordingly. And of course, we have a great bylaw department in the city of Kingston, which is uh, super helpful as well. And, you know, pooling our resources together to try and provide a uh, response. However, um, at the end of the day, there's things that are gonna happen and uh, then we, we're reactive versus proactive. And the big difference being in those cases, what you're explaining is a, a, a reactive situation where possibly we didn't uh, uh, have uh, advanced knowledge of the event. Um, whereas, you know, uh, when we lead into the school year, which is a little, uh, a little more manageable from the, from the idea of we know what's going to happen, at least we can get our liaison teams out, which is something new that we've been doing as well, where our liaison teams are going and uh, communicating with the students, interacting with the students as much as we can to let them know what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. Um, I know Inspector Murdoch's there. I don't want to put her on the spot. If there was, uh, um, if there's something I'm missing on the Canada Day weekend, uh, I encourage anyone to step up, but uh, that that would be my viewpoint from it at this point. Councillor Glenn. Thank you. Um, so my other question has to do with, in your report, you uh, and you've spoken to it a little bit, the spike in tickets compared to last year. Um, my, my thought was that this was actually due to increased policing, which of course I would be in favor of in terms of it being a deterrent. Um, is that not correct, um, you know, or are you actually saying that the parties were worse this year? Uh, I would think that from what I'm hearing from the officers is that it's worse this year. Um, and, uh, you know, what we're doing is sending the liaison teams out first to say, here's what you can do, here's what you can't do. And despite that, they were still seeing the behavior that uh, follows it. Um, open liquor. Of course, uh, you know, we're, and and we're, you know, we had a good uh, relationship with Bylaw, who was issuing the administer uh, the uh, um, the amp tickets, and then our officers who were issuing liquor license offense tickets. So the the majority of our tickets, uh, ninety five plus percent of them were uh, for open alcohol. So um, we, you know, we didn't see tons of that last year. Um, and it was a lot quieter last year. And, and from what I'm gathering, like I said, I'm fairly new to Kingston. Um, each year is something a little bit different and, and it's just something that we have to react to. The only thing that we've done this year is that we've taken a hard approach with sending our liaison teams out 
do the lia liaising with the people, tell them what's acceptable, and then following it up with strict enforcement. And we uh, handpicked a, um, an enforcement team that uh, would go out to uh, conduct this enforcement. So we made sure we had the right people in the right places doing these things. And we're trying to discourage people from obviously bringing open alcohol because then what happens is we have minors who are underage, people in uh, excessive intoxication. And like we saw at move-in weekend, windows being broken, we had a person who was severely injured and the ambulance couldn't get to them due to the people. So it's um, it's unfortunately um, what would appear to be the, the uh, nature of the beast at this point. And uh, certainly the Kingston police are not the answer to this. This is a community problem. However, repeatedly, I think we can see it becomes the police problem and um you know and we are there to answer the call but it is it's it's a community issue and uh, as i've talked about before we have other city departments that bill us uh you know to the police budget to you know have extra resources available to us and it, you know what at the end of the day we're responding this is a community problem we all have to work together to resolve this the kingston police by writing ten thousand tickets isn't going to solve it but at least we're going to bring some revenue back to the city and that's about where we're at right now so we certainly really need everyone to work together to come up with a solution to this uh, this issue because you even look at other universities in the dis in the uh in in ontario they don't see similar activities it's it's uh, it's unique everyone will tell you it's unique to kingston I don't have any further questions, but I am just going to quickly say that I agree it's a community problem, but I consider the police part of this community, and I hope you do as well. Oh, for sure. And uh, right now, we're the we're about the only people out there and uh, with bylaw, which is good. So I agree with you 100% we are, and that's what we're asking, that we, we get everybody together to answer it, because we we singularly are not the the answer to this we need to we need to resolve it and i agree with you 100 percent that it is and i would say the kingston police are 100 percent committed to this and i think uh, that every officer who's been out every weekend so far since september move-in has proven that and they've come out with an idea of enforcement because we're trying to deter the activity that's what we're trying to do deter it so if we can eliminate the alcohol then we can deter the activities that follow and I think that's really the answer uh, here. We just need to, uh, obviously, we're identifying what the issue is. Alcohol is generally the issue. And then obviously the number of students. And no matter how many officers, if we have every officer in uniform working, um, uh, you know, and we put them all out, we're still outnumbered 5,000, 6,000 to 200. And we can't put 200 officers on the road. So it is, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be a community effort and we're open to any ideas that anyone has. And uh, I'm not getting a lot of ideas from anyone. So I would certainly hope that we, we can sit down and, and get those ideas flowing and say, hey, here, what about this? Or what about that? Uh, Cuts Rich. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Oh, sorry, Councillor Stephen. Um, so uh, thank you so much for the presentation, for presenting this financial report, and to all the hard work that yourself, uh, Acting Chief uh, Fraser, and all the staff at the Kingston Police have done. It's really appreciated, including the, the preamble with the details about the challenges that are going on. Uh, I just have two questions. So the first one is on the revenue side. And it has to revolve, it revolves around expenditure recovery. So in quarter one, the expenditure recovery was uh, quite low for what was budgeted uh, for the three, for the first quarter. It was at 22,386. It's now shot up considerably to uh, 425,000 and change. Um, but it still falls below the budgeted, uh, second quarter uh, amount. Uh, so there's two observations out of that. One is that, that the expenditure recovery has uh, greatly improved, um, but there are, may also be some challenges there that the Kingston Police are facing in terms of expenditure recovery. Can you uh, give uh, me some ideas about what those challenges are? Yeah, certainly, and, and I'll certainly explain a couple. Like uh, one would be the court security grant that generally late in the year we find out what our allotment is, um, but we 
we're required to have our budget in a little earlier than that. So I know we had a reduced uh, court security grant than we anticipated. So that is certainly one area where revenue uh, didn't come in where we expected it. Um, another area as well is we had a seconded position uh, to the cannabis enforcement team in the uh, province of Ontario, and we were getting funding for that. And we had to pull the uh, uh, member out of that unit and brought them back into our patrol section. So we no longer are, are receiving the revenue for that one position. So that's certainly a couple things. And um, uh, Scarlett, I know you're uh, sitting there uh, uh, possibly with some uh, some other stuff on the revenue side. Is that something you'd like to hop in on? Just, just so that everyone at home can hear, we'll just ask you to just come up to the mic. That'd be great. Thank you. Can you hear me? Through you, Your Worship. I'll just, in terms of the expenditure recovery, it's really reflective of um, when the when expenses are incurred. So normally we would incur those expenses and then we would be uh, billing them out through some mechanism or recovering them through um, like some sort of an, a grant or something that would offset those or, to, or even sometimes to other um, like police agencies and things like that. So that's kind of what it reflects. So it's really kind of a timing issue that has to be seen in conjunction with the expenses as well. Okay, thank Great, you thank much. you. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, oh sorry, three. <laughs> yeah, if you had more, I wasn't sure if you had further questions or not. I go did, I, I, yep. so I have one other question, and that's, uh, so this is on the expense side. Um, so thank you. So just doing a quick variance analysis, uh, looking at what's going on, um, there's, uh, so WSIB premiums, according to the financial statement, are significantly out of whack with where they're budgeted. They were uh, higher than what was budgeted annually in the first first quarter, and now they're significantly higher. Is are there uh, potential challenges that you uh, or the organization are facing with regards to this specific expense? Yeah, certainly. Um, um, with that, it. And it's ever changing. So uh, in the first quarter, we had four people more off who, uh, uh, who've returned to work and we have another fifth returning uh, uh, next month. So it, it really ebbs and flows and um, uh, in relation to those numbers and we, you know, at any point, uh, we can have a fluctuation there. And uh, once again, I know Scarlett has uh, the, the uh, numbers in front of her right there. I'd turn it over to her to maybe fill in the gaps for me. Thanks. Hi. Sorry. Can you hear me? So in terms of the WSIB premiums, there are um, like some of the budget is reflective actually in the full time wages section, um, which for 2024 budget, we're going to actually have that into the WSIB premiums section so that it's a little more comparable. OK, thank you very much for answering the questions. Thank you, Councilor Shapes. Thank you, Chief Fraser. I only have one question. Within the report, it states that uh, hiring has been deferred and decreased spending. I'm just wondering what kind of impact that has on community safety. Yeah, uh, great question. Thank you. Uh, we Nothing's impacted the front line. We have some uh, positions, uh, uh, civilian positions behind the scenes that we've deferred and we're... Uh, um, looking at, uh, you know, we're looking at our alternatives and options in relation to that. Uh, so we were able to push those off uh, in an attempt to, to kind of salvage money, but it has absolutely no impact on public safety. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Senek. Uh, through you, Your Worship, uh, thank you so much, um, Chief Fraser, for the summary of how the first two weeks at Queen's, uh, you know, uh, Frosh Week was handled with homecoming coming up. Will it be the same, like, you know, like strict enforcement, open alcohol, no tolerance, lots of tickets to really get the word out there that, you know, the parties have to stay inside or better yet, no parties at all? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And that's exactly it. And that's what we're trying to say is, you know, uh, the, the comment I've said is if you don't do it at home, don't think you can do it here. You know, we have a lot of new people who come into the, the community to our post-secondary. 
um, institutions. They're they're a fabric of our community, and uh, obviously uh, we're in a unique position uh, that uh, often the the campus is part of our downtown, and uh, you can have uh, a student housing on uh, in one house, and the neighbor is someone who's lived there for fifty years, and we 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 certainly recognize that. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, we have an operational plan to uh, uh, obviously get us through uh, uh, the the move in. Uh, every weekend that um, uh, takes place between now and homecoming, fake homecoming, Halloween, all of those uh, with the intent of having heavy liaison presence, encouraging students that, you know what, leave it at home. And uh, obviously with uh, uh, the safety uh, initiative that can go on regarding house parties and things like that. But literally, I think, the message is certainly getting through uh, from what I'm hearing from our officers who are on the street weekend to weekend. We're still issuing tickets, but we are so we are, are also encountering students who are indicating that, hey, I understand what's going on. I have my bag. I have uh, alcohol in it and I'm going to a house party. I'm not drinking it on the street. I'm going to take it to the party and, and drink it there or consume it there. So it's it's different. It's never been done. Um, and I think uh, I think it's a step in the right direction, and 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 we're just basically laying the ground rules so that every event is the same. And the big the big thing here is what we instead of being consistently inconsistent, what we need to do is be consistent, so everyone knows. And uh, you know I, I understand. Uh, you know I talk to people who live down in that area, and they're 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 very upset. I understand that, and we're going to do our part and continue to do our part. And um, you know, I think, I, 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 and I'm very positive that it's a step in the right direction. I applaud our officers who are going out there and doing this on a uh, every weekend. I applaud uh, the the students who are understanding and and like I said, when when they tell two friends who tell two friends, the message can get out. But you have to face it. Uh, uh, Kingston is known. Uh, for this, and uh, culture is a very different, a difficult thing to change, but we are in the process of doing that, and um, we will continue to do that on a very daily basis. And the most important part is communication. We have great communication with our post-secondary institutions. We are working at getting into those institutions to get to the students, get to the first-year students. We're delivering uh, letters. We're delivering notes. We're speaking to them firsthand. We're, um, you know, we're meeting them at their events and uh, we'll just continue to do it. So that's what our plan is moving forward. Thank you. And my last question is just switching gears from the Queen students. We saw in the report that the Collins Bay Institution shooting was $78,000, which like was unforeseen. You know, we couldn't have forecasted that. What effect is the drug crisis, like the opioids, you know, uh, crystal meth, is that having a hit on our budget as well, dealing with that? Yeah, you know, um, I think Kingston does a tremendous job, as we saw with uh, the encampment and working on it, and nothing's ever perfect, but working on housing, alternative housing to get people uh, off the streets and, and into some form of housing. Uh, we are definitely seeing an increase in uh, everything. We have a dedicated unit, uh, a drug unit. Uh, we've got a street crime unit. Um, they do a tremendous job. We're trying to, you know, you, you're, you're literally trying to cut the head off the snake. If you can stop the delivery, you're going to stop the, the use. But uh, it's a great question because it is all over. It's prolific around our uh, our community. It's prolific across Ontario and Canada. Every single community is suffering from this. It's uh, having a bottom line on everything from healthcare to, you know, obviously uh, to uh, our drug uh, uh, rehabilitation, uh, everything. And uh, yes, it's certainly affecting us. However, you know, we have a dedicated crew that are out there, and uh, when we see these big events that take place, like homicides that do happen, um, uh, you know, what we're uh, we we have to respond. We do a great job investigating it and bringing people to justice, and we'll just continue to do it. But yeah, we're uh, we're we're like anywhere we're seeing a, a, a rise in all of the importation, um, you know, um, and and uh, the effects are seen. I think 
in our community as they are in many others on a daily basis, which is very unfortunate. And uh, we need to apply as many resources on the backside of this as we can to, to try and get ahead of it. But it's going to be a challenge for everybody moving forward. Okay, uh, Councillor McLaren. Thank you. Um, this is a little scary for me to uh, criticize the police and I want to apologize ahead of time because um, I may have to try and play the heavy with you a little bit, but there were a few red flags I heard with you uh, with some of the comments you made. Among mm -hmm. one of them was um, not knowing what the councillor was talking about. Um, we've tried on a few occasions to speak with um, members of the force on a few occasions and it's there seems to be a small deficiency in that it's hard to get through in some cases. So I'd like to suggest this more as a sense of what's going on in the community and take it please as intelligence, not as mm -hmm. um, a personal criticism or anything like that. But it is important that um, when you do hear criticism or concerns from people who are so in touch with the public, question. There's, a, uh, there's a question coming here. Okay. Um, it is important that uh, they may be taking a little bit seriously. So when you, met, when you mentioned that you didn't know what it was talking about, uh, it was followed shortly by saying that this is not a police problem, it's a community problem. We view you as part of the community, the part of the mm -hmm. community that's being paid full time to deal with these kind of issues. Um, is there any way that you could uh, change gears and um, deal with uh, some of the issues that we're hearing from our public uh, rather than deflecting them or saying that we are doing all that we can do? It might need some thinking outside of the box. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you bring up a great point because, you know, our, our criminal justice system, obviously, we have proactive policing, we have reactive policing. In order to prevent a crime from occurring, there's, there's only three things that really make a crime happen victim, offender, and opportunity. So you have to take one of those things away. Take away the victim, take away the offender, take away the opportunity. If you do that, a crime will never occur. Our justice system, and I'm not deflecting anything, I'm just telling you, you know, 90% of the population do not commit crime. 10% of the population commit 90% of the crime. So we're continually chasing the same people, and it doesn't matter if you want to talk about copper thefts, if you want to talk about downtown, it's the same people, B&Es, uh, thefts of tools, break-ins to the shops, the stuff that our officers are facing on a daily basis. You know, um, you, you, we all know the effect, like, for example, of copper theft. We know the exact, we know the effect. We make an arrest. The people are out. They're, they're out committing copper thefts tonight. And, you know, I think people, you, you know, which is unfortunate, but that is the nature of the beast. So we're chasing the same people, and I'm, I, I, by no means am I deflecting it. Our, our, our people are working diligently. They're making arrests. They're bringing people to justice. But we're bringing the same people repeatedly. And, and uh, you know, unless somebody really goes and sits in a courtroom now, deterrence and rehabilitation are what our justice system was built on. That's what it's, that's what it's built on. Deterrence would be that you don't commit this offense because you're afraid of maybe what the consequence might be. If we take deterrence out of the equation, then we, we're left with rehabilitation. What can we do when we rehabilitate? And we all know the struggles we all have, every community has on the rehabilitation side. We have more people than we have resources. So we are in this wheel, I guess we could say, and, and you know, unfortunately, we can't be everywhere all the time. But and if it, and I apologize if it's taken as a deflection or we're, we will continue to do our, our utmost and our officers do it. And regardless, they will arrest the same person over and over. If you read our 24 hour logs that come in, it's the same people coming in over and over and over and over and over. And, uh, you know, I talk about uh, the, the individual that broke into my condo. You've heard me talk about that before in a, into our condo building. He's done it repeatedly. We take a picture of him, we arrest him, he's out, he comes back and does it again. And um, I've had a number of conversations with people in the community and, and um, you know, at the end of the day, I would say that uh, we have a great, uh, uh, certainly some of the councillors have uh, reached out and we've been working with them as diligent.
Okay, it seems that uh, Acting Chief is frozen uh, at the moment. <laughs> so, um, it, this is actually probably a good time to interject. I'm just looking at our time. So, it is almost nine o'clock and we are at page two of our agenda. <laughs> So, what I would just say, if there's any other questions related specifically to the information report, oh, I'm sorry, Chief, uh, I've just sort of inter interjected there. Um, so, any other questions related specifically to the information report regarding the budget items? Obviously, we can have a larger discussion about police, but I'm just, uh, is there anything else before we move on in our agenda? Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, uh, Chief, thank you very much, uh, and thank you to, um, thank to everyone else from, from police. Um, we have no further briefings tonight. Uh, are there any petitions to present? Okay, seeing none, uh, we will move on. We have uh, two additional motions of uh, congratulations, recognition, sympathy, condolences, and speedy recovery. Uh, so first, uh, number one, moved by Councillor Glenn, seconded by Councillor Hassan. The Kingston City Council recognize October 8th to 14th, 2023 as Fire Prevention Week. The theme for 2023 is cooking safety starts with you. According to the National Fire Prevention Association, cooking is the leading cause of home fires and home injuries, with unattended cooking being the leading cause of home cooking fires and related deaths. Kingston Fire and Rescue, along with other fire departments through North Ontario and North America, will be educating residents on cooking safety messages to support this year's theme. Kingston City Council thanks Kingston Fire and Rescue for their work and encourages all residents to understand the fire risk of unattended cooking and to think of ways that they can better protect themselves and their loved ones. Moved by Mayor Patterson, seconded by Deputy Mayor Osterhoff, that the sincere condolences of Kingston City Council be extended to the family, friends, and peers of Shauna Pritchard, who passed away on September 9th, 2023, after a brief illness. Shauna will be remembered for her kindness, warmth, and her infectious optimism towards life. A beloved daughter, sister, aunt, and friend, she will also be deeply missed by her colleagues at Kingston Transit, where she was admired for her leadership, commitment to service, and her inclusive approach that made everyone feel valued and part of the team. Our hearts are with Shauna's family, especially her mother Sharon, stepfather Ron, sister Marissa, nephew Aiden, and niece Avery. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed, and that's carried. Okay, moving on to deferred motions. We have one deferred motion with respect to the textile recycling pilot project. This is the item that appeared on our July 11th, 2023 council meeting. Um, Madam Clerk, do we have a mover and a seconder to put that back on the floor? Um, my recollection is that it was moved by Councillor Amos and seconded by Councillor Osanek. So in order to put it back on the floor, we would need another mover because Councillor Amos is not here tonight. Okay, so moved by uh, Councillor Chinani, seconded by Councillor Glenn to put it on the floor. Now, small point of order. Yes. Um, what are we actually putting on the floor? I noticed that the recommendation in the report is different from the recommendation in the agenda. Yes. So you'll see that we have two contrasting recommendations. The first recommendation is the deferred motion. So we will deal with that one. If that item was to fail, then there's an opportunity then to move forward into the report to deal with the secondary uh, recommendations and the uh, report number 77. So the recommendation as it appears in the agenda is the one that is being put on the floor right now to debate. Mm -hmm. Say that again. So the original recommendation from July the one yes. in the agenda is the one being put in there, not the reported one. That's right. One so just okay. to be clear, we're under deferred motions. So we have one deferred motions. That's one, number one, Techstar Recycling Pilot Project. And yes, as Councilor McLaren has pointed out, that is the original recommendation that we deferred from our July 11th meeting. Now, I just have a feeling we might be on this item for a while. So I'm going to propose that we take a 10-minute break. It's 8.59. We will reconvene at... 9, 10.
All right, folks, it is 9.10, so we will reconvene. I'll ask if people can uh, grab their seats, please. All right. Okay, so just to uh, reconvene, on the floor is now uh, the deferred motion, which is the original Clause 1 textile recycling pilot project. Uh, Councillor McLaren. Thank you. This was incredibly clear until all the presentations came in, so I now have a ton of questions. <laughs> first of all, um, if we go with this first motion or recommendation that is on the floor before us right now, are we precluding both Diabetes Canada and uh, Renew Square from um, competing against each other, proposing new sites? Uh, Commissioner Joyce. Thank you, and through you, Your Worship. So the original uh, motion, or the sorry, the original report and recommendation was to enter into a single um, agreement with Renewal Squared uh, for the establishment of the um, collection bins. Yes, I get that. But could the other one come in and do the same thing? Say we want a few more locations. So that would require a change then if we were to do that. Oh, no, 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 Is sorry, it like possible? They... Yes, it's possible. Um, if we were to take the uh, secondary report, say we were to vote this down and then propose the second one, in that case, are both of them able to compete also? So from what I understand from the presentations and what was originally proposed, so Renewal Squared could handle the 15 sites. Uh, Diabetes Canada expressed an interest in five additional sites, which we could do. So the original request from Renew Square and the new request from Diabetes Canada would then be accommodated in the new form in the secondary, the one that's not before us right now, is that correct? So the, this, the second recommendation and the second report um, directs staff to issue an RFP. We could issue the RFP to have that flexibility to have two proponents be okay. satisfied. So here's my concern. I would prefer very much to have um, Renew Square out here. It seems that they have they're entrepreneurial. It seems that they want to um, make the pie bigger. There's 85% that's being unaccounted for. And um, it seems to be moving the other uh, groups, such as Diabetes Canada, to propose new things. This is a good thing in every way that I can imagine. So I don't want to limit them at the same time. So with the new RFP, um, you just said that it could be done. That wasn't planned to be done, or do you need more direction from council, like an amendment to the next one? Because I don't want to vote this down and not be able to allow the maximum amount of entrance into the market, which is why I have to ask about both of them, in, even though we're talking about the first one. Commissioner Joyce. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. So the... Ideally, it would be good to have direction from this council in, in what you would like us to do. We're amenable to um, making the changes that would be required to meet those requirements if you wanted um, two entities to be collecting textiles on city properties. Okay, well with that information, Your Worship, may I... Um call for recess while we make an amendment here because that was unknown information a few minutes ago. Or would you just simply allow me to speak it? Uh, here's what I would recommend. Since we've just taken a recess, what I would suggest is that you use your time to make what argument you want. And if you convince one of your other colleagues that they want to put forward that amendment, then they can take that time and do that while the debate is going on. I think that would probably be the best approach at this point. Okay. okay. I will defer to your wisdom on this. Therefore, I hope that somebody would consider that we want to, we want to get as much of that 85% that is being diverted to landfills as possible. We have an entrepreneurial company here that's willing to do that. They've also shaken up the existing market that's already been there. And that's a good thing from our perspective. We want more diversion. Um, Things have been done in a certain way for a very long time, and uh, that 85 has not moved. So this would be an ideal time 
to open up the market in that sense. Uh, if his, his vision is correct and he makes a great deal of uh, income from it, I suspect there will be a lot of more entrants into the market, and this is something that we need to do in the amendment. So we've heard from staff that uh, we're not going to take a break to do this, so I'm hoping that somebody will write an amendment that says that the RFP allow for a maximum of number of entrants to maximize the ability to um, defer, or sorry, to, um, to redirect textiles away from landfills into, um, into recycling materials. Um, yeah, basically that's it. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> yeah, I don't think that that works, but that was a good try. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, next time I list is Councillor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. I have learned so much about textiles tonight. Um, so I think, I just have some questions for staff. So we had a presentation from Diabetes Canada. They said they don't like RFPs, but they also don't want us to vote for this motion. So you've been in discussion with Diabetes Canada and the delegate wasn't very clear about the nature of that discussion. Could you just elaborate a bit on the relationship the city has with Diabetes Canada um, and what the, the that what that relationship is like? Because that wasn't made clear in the de in, from the delegate. Commissioner Joyce. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. So we had a uh, discussion with Diabetes Canada a few weeks ago when they had reached out to us indicating that they would like to work with the city of Kingston to introduce this textile recycling program that they have. Uh, they met with um, Public Works and Solid Waste staff uh, to go over some of the aspects of their proposal, um, indicating this is something that they've put in place with some other cities. Uh, so th that was really the extent of any discussions with them, was really that single meeting where they presented, and you've got a copy of the uh, presentation that, that looks very similar to, I think, what we had been presented with as well. Uh, and, and it was at, after that meeting that we decided, okay, so there's another player in town that can provide a similar level of service that, that um, Renewal Squared was uh, proposing to provide to the city of Kingston as well. So that's when we realized, okay, perhaps we need to open this up a bit more for that. So, so staff are anticipating that there would be other players in this as well if we cancel this, defer, defeat this motion, and do a request for proposals, correct? All I can say is that we are now aware of two entities <laughs> out there that could provide this service. Now, um, Diabetes Canada indicated tonight that they're interested in five sites, uh, which is um, much less than Renewal Squared um, with their 15 sites that they were uh, proposing. Okay, um, okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Glenn. Thank you, and through you. Um, I think I'm just gonna cut to the chase. I was okay with this from the get-go um, because it's a pilot, and I think that this is worth doing. We're already in a situation where the longer we continue to defer motions, investigate, do RFPs, the more of this is going to a landfill. We already have at least, what, eight nonprofits that are already doing this and quite clearly cannot meet the needs. In my opinion, from what I've seen tonight, Diabetes Canada has every opportunity to do this and have had many years um, to explore the market here in Kingston. Um, I do think that having somebody with an entrepreneurial uh, bent come in and take a stab at this is good. The feasibility will be shown pretty quickly because either the business is feasible or it's not. Um, and they're going to be, I think, a bit more creative about how they go about it because this is their primary business. Um, 
The nonprofits do a lot of other different things, and we all appreciate that, and I appreciate them. Um, it doesn't seem like there's uh, a lack of product available. So right now, I'm just going to simply say that I, I don't have any further questions. I'm going to vote for this motion. I don't think we actually need an amendment because this doesn't preclude somebody else coming into this market. It doesn't exclude people from approaching us and expanding into this market. Um, so I'd like to see this project move forward. I think it's well thought out. Um, I really appreciated hearing the presentation uh, this evening because that sort of cemented my opinion on the matter. Um, and I do want everybody to think about how much more is going to go to the landfill in the meantime. Uh, if this is such an emergency, then maybe we should get going. Let's try this pilot and see what we, we get from it and continue to explore other options. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sinek. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, so, uh, <laughs> where to start? First of all, the biggest takeaway for, uh, for me from this entire discussion is that now we know that anything stained or damaged can actually go into any of those textile bins. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Like, that's why I've never done it before, um, thinking that everything has to be in a sellable condition. Now we know that it does not. And um, that should help with landfill just off the bat if we get the word out that, you know, that's everyone should do damage stained goods in those textile bins as, as well as your regular clothing and whatnot. Um, but since we've heard from Diabetes Canada and they're just as interested, I want to give both players a fair shake. And I know that when Diabetes Canada was um, presenting, they talked about how they did go to staff back in 2017 and again in 2019. I just want to remind Council that back then, there was um, Heather Roberts was the Director of Waste and Bill Lennon was the Director of Public Works and the Commissioner at the time for both was Jim Keach. And so we've had staff turnover since that time. So I think that's important to remember is that, yes, now Diabetes Canada is coming to the staff we have, Commissioner Brad Joyce and our Director Karen Santucci for both Public Works and for waste and you know so like we can't it's unfair to say to diabetes well how come the city didn't use you back then those staff are gone and now we're hearing it fresh eyes fresh ears for the first time tonight so um um, you know, I support Diabetes Canada. I talked personally to a city councillor in Oshawa that's using Diabetes Canada. They also have bins at their city facilities from another nonprofit as well, and it's working out fine. And as we heard tonight, they have Diabetes Canada has 100 bins just in Markham. They started in the GTA, started to move eastward, and then we had COVID. So I have no blame on Diabetes Canada as to why they haven't already expanded in Kingston. But tonight they asked to expand in Kingston. They only want up to, you know, five bins. We heard that Renewal Squared wants 15 bins. That's what staff just told us. So let's have both because we have lots of city facilities. This is a pilot. That way we can compare too about how the collection of the bins, um, you know, uh, uh, the cleansiness, how often they do get picked up, you know, um, maybe we'll see that one company doesn't do it as well as the other. Hopefully both companies will do it fine and they can expand to even more sites, more bins across Kingston. So with that, I just want to move an amendment. I'm not deferring anything, right? I just like get this motion on the floor and with an amendment of just adding the words um, and Diabetes Canada. Okay, so we have a motion to amend the deferred motion that adds the words in bold. So with the amendment, it would, so basically the amendment is to add um, the wording up to 15 collection bins and Diabetes Canada up to five collection bins to be placed and then to be placed exterior locations and city properties for a nine month term. So everyone can see what the motion would look like with the amendment. Uh, it has been moved by Councillor Senek, seconded by Councillor McLaren. 
So, Councillor Rosanna, you have the floor if there's anything else you want to say to your amendment or if you've already spoken to it. I've already spoken. Okay. Discussion on the amendment. Councillor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Would we be in any violation of any agreement we would have with um, uh, the renewal, thank you, renewal squad if we approve this? Squared, renewal squared. Sorry, it's been a long night. Commissioner Joyce. Thank you, and through you, sorry, could you just ask that question again, Councilor? Yeah, it was, that wasn't super clear. Uh, would we be in any, would this contradict the agreement we would sign with Renewal Squared if we approve this amendment? Because they're, they want 15, and then we're also saying the other thing can have five. Thank you, uh, and through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, no, it would not contravene. Okay, uh, second question is, even if we didn't approve this, would, Diabetes can still be allowed to have five textile bins in Kingston. Do we need to give direction to staff to uh, to give staff the leeway to do this? Well, thank you for the question and through you, Mr. Mayor. So we would need direction because it's on what the proposal is is about placing those bins on city property. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Would you take the chair? I will, and I recognize you, Mayor Patterson. Thank you. So, I appreciate the spirit of what the amendment is trying to do. I do agree that often, when there's an opportunity for compromise and working together, that we should pursue those opportunities. The issue that I have is that Diabetes Canada was clear that they did not want to work with Renewal Square. So, to the proposal about you know, two organizations both wanting to have bins side by side or working together, um, I'm, I would be fine with that, but you need both parties. I think for this to work, if you're gonna pilot both, then you need both organizations to wanna to work together. So we heard from Renewal Square, they're happy to work with everybody, but the converse was not true. So that's concerning to me because uh, I think that in good faith, if we wanna be fair to everybody, we should give everybody the same opportunity. I think based on what I heard from Diabetes Canada tonight, I'm concerned about how this actually would work in practice. So for that reason and that reason only, I'm gonna vote against the amendment because I'm concerned about what happens when we bring both parties on that they're obviously not uh, interested in working together, at least on the one side. Thank you. Thank you, I return the chair. Okay, anybody else on the amendment? Councilor Glenn. Thank you and through you. I'm not going to vote for the amendment. Um, if we're talking about fairness, then let's be honest, with a new business trying to get a foothold in this sector, it is now competing against a very large and well-known entity. It may be a nonprofit, but all that means is that we don't have money going back into a corporate pocket. It doesn't mean much more than that. I appreciate Diabetes Kennedy. I appreciate what they do. We're talking recycling. And to get a handle on this, we need to give opportunity for new entities to actually be able to thrive in this market. So I think it's actually an unfair amount of competition for them. Um, you know, as a business owner, competing against a nonprofit is extraordinarily difficult, especially a well-known one. Um, so I faced it myself in my own career, and. So, for that reason alone, if we're talking fairness and, um, you know, having the opportunity to actually move the needle on what we need to do with recycling, I'm not going to be in favor of this. Okay, next is Councillor Shapes. Thank you. Um, question, does Diabetes Canada already have a presence in Kingston? Can, uh, Commissioner Joyce. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor, yes, they do. Do we know where they have their presence? Is there any on city property? Through you, Mr. Mayor, thank you for the question. Um, we have one situated at this recycling center at uh, Lavins Lane. And we also have a cerebral policy one. So Is there a service contract with that? There's no contract. Okay, so they do have presence already in, in Kingston. Um, I do believe according to the website, they have about four or five already. So. Um, I'm not sure if they're asking for five more or five overall. So, but with what I've heard today, I can't support this amendment either. 
Okay, next is Councillor Chenani. I originally had submitted an amendment to do this, but I had reflected back thinking that my question that I asked about working together, um, that they really didn't want to, so it made me rethink it and listening to what other people were saying. Um, I also have prediabetes, so, but I, I can't support this either. I think the pilot would be more effective with having one company or one entity who has the drive to do it. Um, and their presentation was flawless in my opinion. It had all the data and um, the other presentation didn't really answer all the questions. So, and I think that, you know, we should give a year pilot to the one and then after that we can see what happens and open it up for for any other people to, to see if this didn't work out kind of thing. So that would be my opinion. Okay, thank you. Councillor Sun. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Um, uh, I'm agree with my colleagues, and I think Councillor Glenn has uh, said that twice very well. And thank you very much for summarizing very well. Um, the first presentation has, has been here twice. Uh, he been explained. Uh, they are been explaining through the email and through the report. Also, city staff has spent a time on it, and I am not against the, any um, nonprofit organization. I am a big supporter of the nonprofit organizations, uh, but also uh, as the councilor Glenn mentioned, that uh, the paid work and volunteer work has always uh, the quality different. The quality of uh, service is, is, a, is a different, and. The first presentation, the gentleman has laid down everything very well, very well explained plan they have to do it. They will do it as a business, not as a, as a volunteer. So they will take care of that. And few of the their bins in the city, one of at ours, where is my location, is my, my business is, a uh, long time ago, it was very, um, uncontrolled situation where it was, they was not managed very, very well. Um, and I think that's the biggest issue will be if we put those bins together. The one thing, they don't want to work together because one is a business, one is, is just a volunteer. And the business will invest money into to taking care of it, whether monitoring and um, cleaning them up and you know, to, to taking their stuff quite often. And other one will just probably leaving there to compete them to make them uh, look bad. So I believe that according to the city staff report and all the work has been done on to this one, we, I will uh, not vote uh, in the favor of amendment. And I think we should move with the first presentation and allow them to, this is a nine month project only. And if we don't feel comfortable, then they've been here before, they can come back and offer the services. And we can, we can look into that. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor Ostroff. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and I just, I think I'm gonna agree with the past councillors and appreciate their comments because I was part of the deferral um, a few months ago and with Councillor Amos and I brought us here. So um, all along my focus was on the need for fairness within the, within the charitable organizations who do the thrift work and, uh, and the deep respect and the important place they have in our community. And so I, I think that I too appreciate the, the, the presentation from Newell Square and the commitment um, and the, to, uh, to, to work as closely as possible with and, and the, for the success, the continued success of, of um, our thrift stores here who, who, uh, who do the important work. So uh, adding, adding another one right now that it's actually charitable or not for profit um, confuses the issue a little bit. And let's, let's keep it clean for now and let them run with it, let them prove what they're saying and uh, work within the, their business plan which is very complete, and then we, we can look at it again with the city's uh, wise eyes on it to over 10 months, so nine months, whatever it is. So I, I won't be supporting this, though. I do respect the rationale for it. I'm absolutely respectful of Diabetes Canada, uh, phenomenal uh, work and, and fundraising, but in this case, let's keep it separated and uh, look at it again uh, down the road. Thank you. Okay, anybody else to the amendment? Councilor McLean. Thank you. Okay, so there's been a lot of points that have been made and it's time to challenge some of them. Um, with the first question, if we were to add five more, 
would they all have to be at the same location as five of the other ones? Or could they be at different locations? Commissioner Joyce? Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor, they would be uh, different locations. So there would not be any direct competition between them. This would be an increase of opportunities for the people of Kingston to deposit their spare clothing. That doesn't seem to be a bad thing. We've got extra locations. One case, we had 15, now we got 20. Why wouldn't we want to take those opportunities and give them to the people if they want to recycle this thing? Since they're different sites, it doesn't matter if they don't want to work together. I believe that was your um, objection. They, these two companies don't want to work together. So what, they're not at the same place. And even if they were at the same place, even if they were in competition with each other, if one doesn't want to do that, that's a lack of entrepreneurial spirit. That's, <laughs> that's like giving up an opportunity to help fix the planet. I mean, if you have any concerns that we are wasting um, a lot of space in landfills with you know, <laughs> um, stuff that could be recycled, there's a harm in that that we are ignoring here. And as such, I think that we should maximize the opportunities that people have in Kingston to, re to deposit their unwanted clothing and uh, textiles. So it strikes me that the objections that were given here um, were given before they recognized some of the information that was just re re released to us. Um, also, one of the other ones was that the either the nonprofit or the profit, they would um, not do a very good job. You can't assume that now. You gotta see what they do. You can't just make a prejudiced deci decision like that and say, oh, one side's not gonna do a good job and the other one is. That's, that's about as prejudicial as we can get and that's inappropriate. Um, the idea that, com that, that uh, competition confuses the issue no, that's not true, and they're not even competing against each other. Com competition provides greater choice to people. Which one do they want to support while actually reducing landfills? So I don't see any of these objections as actually standing up to logic and reason at this point. Um, so I'm gonna still vote for this because I think better opportunities for people. Who doesn't want to actually have a better opportunity? One of the things that was mentioned in the um, <coughs> presentation is that the number one reason why people don't recycle is they can't find one. So we're limiting the number of available options to them by not letting Diabetes Canada also do this at this time. If you take that seriously, if you actually want to take care of the world and uh, improve our recycling and our diversion, it's important to maximize this. Um, and honestly, if this country was sort of built on entrepreneurship. We have somebody shaking up the market. Let them do that. There might be other entrants after this because we've already heard that there's no, this is not preventing somebody else from giving us a proposal. <laughs> Let's do this. This is win-win for everybody. It doesn't have to be, or the objections that were given, rethink them through because they don't make sense to me. Thank you. Okay, anybody else on the motion to amend? Council Senate, you have the last word. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. I guess I should have done a point of clarification uh, when I heard you go on about that that would be shared locations. I heard that right at the beginning of both delegations that they didn't want bins side by side. But when I wrote this amendment of up to five bins and then up to 15 bins, I meant different locations, 15 locations for Renewal Squared and five locations for um, Diabetes Canada because it was quite clear be, because of who made what mess, you know, they don't want the bins side by side. So sorry about that. But the most important part is that we're diverting textiles from garbage and as Councillor McLaren just said, having um, 15 locations across Kingston versus 20, you know, this will give five more locations to put the textiles for everyone spread out across Kingston. Thank you. Okay, we'll call the vote on the motion to amend. All those in favor? Opposed? And that loses by a vote of two to 10. Okay, so we are back to the main uh, clause uh, now as not amended. Um, next on my list is Councillor Shapes. Thank you. For clarification, how long would it take to put the, approximately, 
um, the pilot project into action and how long would it take for RFP? Commissioner Joyce. Thank you and through you, Mr. Mayor. So I believe Renewal Squared indicated that they could, um, once the agreement is signed, uh, get the bins in place within a two week time frame. Uh, to do the RFP, uh, that would take uh, a few weeks, <laughs> to say to say the least, uh, to frame that up. And to go through all the applicants and everything else, like from start to finish, to actually get something on? So like start to finish on the RFP to award, we're probably looking at about a three month time frame. Okay, so time wise, the pilot project we could get boots on the ground technically by the end of the month. Correct. Commissioner Joyce? Sorry, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. And with the pilot project, if there are concerns within that could pop up, either wrong locations or we get complaints from the nonprofits, we could amend that as we go along, correct? Or, or end it early? So, yes, the way the agreement is set is that um, the city can revoke any sites at any point for any reason. Okay, um, good to know. So, I'm going to support this motion because basically it gets boots on the ground, bins in place, people can use them, we can advertise it um, on our website and everything else, and we can start removing textile recyclables from landfills. Thank you. Uh, thank you, so uh, next I have Councillor Hassan and then Councillor Stephen. Thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> Again, uh, I think this is an excellent uh, opportunity for the uh, renewal square, renewal square, and uh, we we should get, give them a chance. And I think uh, city staff has done a very good job uh, preparing the report, uh, having done the survey and uh, writing up the agreement. And I think in, we are in good hand. If we have all the opportunity, if we not like it, we we can revoke it again. Um, the other other parties as well, you know they. They have the opportunity again to apply from a different venue or different avenue they can come through and then we can look into that. But this time I will support this one to let's put the uh, foot on the ground and keep going. Thank you, Councillor Stephen. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Um, I am a fan of Renewal Squared and that's because they're small. Uh, they're central here in Eastern Ontario. I think we can get a lot of really positive attention there and they're just starting up so we're I would say on the radar quite significantly for them. Um, they answered my questions when it came to shipping and other, um, what they would actually take. And we heard, I think, mixed information. Um, and frankly, I think staff have spent enough time on this. Uh, we need to make a decision tonight. And I think that we should vote as soon as everyone is ready. Thank you, Councillor Chinani. Uh, hi, yeah, so I'm happy to go with this one also uh, because they have a clear plan um, and a clear vision and you know, they answered all the questions. Um, my question to staff is, is if they wanted 20, could we give them 20? Or is it stuck on the maximum of 15? Commissioner Joyce. Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. So staff were the ones that limited renewal squared to 15. Um, sites uh, for their bins. Um, so that's 15 sites. They could have multiple bins on any, any of the sites that uh, they deem it required to be. Um, if the pilot was successful, I can tell you the, in, the intent of that was because it's a pilot, we wanted to limit the sites a little bit to see if this was going to work, particularly with respect to um, garbage, which we know is a problem in mean, graffiti and those kind of things. So we didn't want to go too large uh, for the nine month pilot until we determined that they were capable of actually maintaining those sites to the expectations and standards that we're establishing in the agreement. 
Uh, so that was the reason for the 15. At the end of the pilot, we would come back to council with a proposal potentially to extend further and also to look at any additional sites that we think would be warranted in, in agreement with uh, uh, Renewal Squared. Thank you. Okay, anybody else on deferred motion number one? Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, moving on to reports. First up, we have report number 76 from the CAO. Moved by Councillor Hassan, seconded by Councillor Osanek. The report number 76 from the Chief Administrative Officer consent be received and adopted. So there's just the one clause, request for temporary noise exemption, Leon Center music concert. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Report number 77 from the CAO. Moved by Councillor Osterhoff. Sorry. Moved by Councillor Shave, second by Councillor Ridge. The report 77 from the Chief Administrative Officer recommend be received and adopted clause by clause. Okay, so the first clause has been uh, removed. It is now, uh, it is now moot. So we'll move to clause two, capital project status report, August 2023. All those in favor? Opposed, and that's carried. Next, we have Clause 3, 275 Queen Street, proposed three-party settlement. Councillor Rich. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, and in the spirit of this evening, I'll be brief. Uh, I just wanted to uh, say a thank you to all the parties involved in getting to this settlement, and that uh, as difficult as it has been uh, in, in some instances, that there have been many positive outcomes that have come out of it, including additional funding for Lionhearts. And um, uh, looking at uh, the Queen Street Improvement Plan moving forward again, which is something I'm very interested in. So I just wanted to mention those pieces, that there have been positive outcomes out of this. Uh, we've come to the settlement, and I really hope everybody votes for it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, we will call the vote on Clause 3. All those in favor? Opposed, and that's carried. Okay, on to report number 78 from Planning Committee. Moved by Councillor McLaren, seconded by Deputy Mayor Osterhoff, that report 78 from the Planning Committee be received and adopted. Okay, there are two clauses. Uh, would anyone like them separated? Councillor Sanic? Okay, we'll do them, we'll, we'll deal with them separately then, because there's two. So first is official plan and zoning bylaw amendment 1274 Highway 15. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Clause two, zoning bylaw amendment and draft plan of subdivision five to seven Cataractway Street. Councillor Sack. Uh, yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you, um, just uh, to staff, um, this comes with opening up River Street to Rito Street, and we have to go, you know, expand the city right away. And it was brought to our attention tonight that it could affect two maple trees that are very large on the north side of River Street. So can we give attention to those trees, try to work like the River Street expansion around the trees so we don't have to cut them down? Mr. Park. Uh, thank you, and through your, Mr. Mayor. Um, the right away on Rideau Street right now is 20 meters, so it is not getting any larger. So if those trees are within the existing right of way, once the final plan comes in for the road work uh, that is extending River Street out to Rideau, the design of that, because there's also going to be multi-purpose paths and a sidewalk, where that's all going to go will really determine if those trees will be able to be saved or not, but the fact that they've been brought to our attention, that we will have that noted. Yep. Okay, uh, Councilor Rich. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, I just have a few questions for staff uh, regarding this uh, proposal. So the uh, first question is, can someone please provide a summary of the remaining steps in the process and where the authority will be for each decision point? Mr. Park. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, boy, 
process. We've got another hour here, so no, I, I will. Uh, a brief summary, please. I will give you a Reader's Digest version. So right now, the report that's before you tonight is a, it's really the start of the process. It's the zoning amendment application and the draft plan of subdivision. If council approves that tonight, then what happens is the applicant has to fulfill the draft conditions of subdivision, which is a series of studies and a more in-depth uh, analysis, such as stormwater flow, traffic analysis. They, very important to this site, they also have to come up uh, with a, uh, rec um, a recommended uh, site uh, conditions, because the site is uh, contaminated. In order to do that, they have to get provincial uh, approval to do that. Once all those approvals are ready to go, a final plan of subdivision is approved. Right now that authority rests with the Director of Planning uh, under delegated authority. However, Council, uh, through a motion at Council if they so choose, can bump that up to Council for final approval. So with the RSC on this site, I would say we're probably looking at at least two years before we get to that point. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is, what steps are being taken to ensure contaminated items and land being removed from the property will not have an effect on the residents of Orchard Street and Cataraqui Street? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, the um, record of site condition I have spoken to the uh, developer will be coming up with a uh, mitigation strategy for the site, uh, a more detailed one. So it will all depend on what they end up proposing, whether it's to keep the contaminants uh, in situ on the site and they're capped by foundations. Um, it also very much depends on the nature of the contaminants because if they're, they're stable and they can be removed from the site and then they're taken to a designated uh, facility uh, in the province where they're accepted. Um, it, it will all depend on the strategy that has come up with. Either way, at the end of the day, the contaminants that are on the site have to be managed accordingly and the province will approve how that is done and how they will be dealt with. So they there should be no, at the end of the day, uh, effect on the abutting residents in terms of those contaminants. Thank you very much. Okay, we will call the vote on clause two. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, report number 79 from the Municipal Accessibility Advisory Committee. Moved by Councillor Tozo, seconded by Councillor Stephen, that Report 79 from the Municipal Accessibility Advisory Committee be received and adopted. So there's just the one clause, Proposed Community-Led Accessible Playground Project. Councillor Rosanek. Thank you, Your Worship. I just threw you, I just have one question to staff, and that's why in the recommendation it just says a city-owned park, and um, but the report talks about Shannon Park, and we heard tonight all the benefits of having it at Shannon Park. So uh, like, I don't want this brand new, um, all-inclusive park to go, you know, in the downtown area where the other accessible features are. Like I want it to be at Shannon Park, so I'm worried about approving this recommendation without it even saying Shannon Park. Like, are we, are we doing Shannon Park, and how come it doesn't say Shannon Park? Commissioner Joyce. Thank you for the question, and through you, Mr. Mayor. So the reason it doesn't is because this, this project is really in its incipient phase, and the discussions that um, I've had with Rachel, with the proponent, has been, you know, we looked at sites, we came up with, with actually uh, possibly three sites, um, Shannon's top list, but we said, you know, as we learn more, and she is actually learning significantly more as she continues into this process, uh, some learnings from the United States, for instance, where they have some of these inclusive playgrounds. As we, as we have more information, it may, lead us to something a little bit different. So we're trying to keep that flexibility there so that we're not committing 100% 
uh, to it being in Shannon Park, but Shannon Park certainly seems like the most likely candidate at this, at this stage. But we wanted to leave it loose a little bit because she's still uh, gathering a lot of intelligence about inclusive parks um, around North America. And so we wanted, to, we wanted to maintain that flexibility for her. So that's the reason it wasn't specifically in the recommendation that helps. Um, thank you for that information. Are the other two locations basically in the north end as well? Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the other locations were um, sort of on the east side and on the west side. Uh, okay, like I'll approve this, but I really want it to be in the north end. <laughs> because when we did put in some accessible features in Rotary Park many years ago now, um, I did hear you know, that the North End needs it. Like, why is it City Park? Why is it Lake Ontario Park? Now it's Rotary Park. Like, we need things in the North End. And uh, Shannon Park, you know, I don't want the East, the East End has a lot right now, has a lot right now, and I would, you know, Shannon Park or somewhere else in the North End. I know this is still beginning, but that is what I want to see. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Deputy Mayor, would you take the chair? I will, Mayor Patterson, and I recognize you. So I hear what Councillor Osanek is saying. So I think I just, just want to clarify. Is it fair to say that Shannon Park is the preferred location and there would it would obviously be, have to be for a very good reason why it wouldn't be going to Shannon Park. Is that, is that fair? Yes, that is absolutely correct. Okay. So I think based on that, I appreciate what councillors, I think we're all in agreement. That is absolutely the preference. I think that we're signaling to staff that we absolutely want everything that we can do to make sure that it's, it's going to go there. But obviously we're just keeping that door open just in case there's a really good reason why for whatever reason, just the physical requirements, the space, whatever else, that we might look at a different location. So for that reason, I'm comfortable with it, but it's not right in the, the recommendation, but I think that point has been made, and I'm happy to add my voice to that, Councillor Senate. Thank you. I return the chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Tosa. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Uh, I'd just like to take a moment to applaud the work Rachel and the whole team has done. There's about 50 people working on this. So they have really put together a giant team of people who are dedicated to this. They're ready to get going. And my compliments to the Councillor Oosterhoff. We've really kind of uh, worked on this together and tag teamed it. It's ple a pleasure to work with another councillor on this. So uh, please, I, I hope that everybody approves this. Uh, they gave a really good presentation, a really good presentation to Mac as well. Um, let's build some accessible parks, or inclusive parks, thank you. Okay, we will, oh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Deputy Mayor Osterhoff. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Patterson, and uh, I, I, I'm confident this will be supported, and I do wanna thank uh, Rachel and, and the presentation tonight and her partner there, that was excellent. Uh, really, what we're talking about is a lot of education right now, too. We have a lot to learn here, and uh, I wanna commend the city uh, who has, uh, you know, um, Brad, who has really helped out here, Commissioner Joyce, sorry. And, uh, you know, that's really going to be really critical to getting something like this off the ground. It's um, like we heard, it's in its infancy, but uh, the dream is there. And um, <laughs> it, it's something that um, I would, I really hope that the city gets behind it too. The significant fundraising will be required. Um, do, we have an idea of what, how much one park could cost, right? And could I say about a million dollars per park? And uh, so that's a lot of money, but the, the, a dream can make that happen. And uh, I think we can actually, in this city, Mayor Patterson, I think we can have three of these. <laughs> That's what I believe. And uh, and so we're going to, uh, we're doing a lot of work behind the scenes. I know that the committee really is, as we've heard. And uh, and so I'm just encouraging council behind it, but also representing that this whole city gets behind something that's so important and, uh, and will be so well used and it will be, uh, be a credit to our city. And uh, I'm looking forward to the full support here. Thank you. Thank you. We will call the vote on clause one. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, we have nothing from Committee of the Whole. Information reports, uh, just uh, if you have any questions, just raise your hand as I read through them. Uh, number one, disconnection of a natural gas service. Uh, Councillor Glenn. 
Thank you, and through you. Um, so thank you very much uh, for the report. I thought it was fairly clear, except that uh, there did not seem to be any mention of what's the monthly cost of leaving a meter connected. Um, and I just also would like clarification that when somebody decides not to use gas, convert to another energy source, they leave that meter connected, that the responsibility for the maintenance is with Utilities Kingston and not with the homeowner. Mr. Felt. Thank you for your question and through you, Your Worship. Um, I'm looking to my colleague, Mr. Miller, for the answer to the first question. So we're just gonna ask you to just give the answer through the mic just so that um, uh, live stream can hear it. I think he doesn't have that information at his fingertips, Councillor. Apologies. The answer to the second question is yes, we can confirm. It's Utilities Kingston responsibility to maintain the meter as well as the infrastructure, underground infrastructure. It's, it's on the order of something we, we will get the accurate information for you, Councillor. It's a minimum charge. It's somewhere under $20 a month. Thank you, that gives me a, a very good ballpark. So needless to say, it's far less expensive to simply leave it connected rather than having everything taken out given what we've seen. Thank you. That's it. Uh, Councillor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Um, I have a question along the similar line of Councillor Glenn. Do we have any idea of how many customers have disconnected their gas, because the report was pretty ambiguous about this, and are still paying the 20 or $30 per month fee? Thank you for the question, Councillor. Uh, through you, Your Worship, I think at this point, um, we have not seen a large number of disconnects uh, of natural gas. Um, I think right now we have two or three that are pending. However, I believe those customers yet have not made a decision as to whether or not uh, they would have the service removed uh, completely, as we indicated in the report, or whether or not they would leave the meter hanging. So we, we haven't had any really actually uh, complete that process as of yet. Historically, when we have had a disconnection of gas and the customer wanted it removed completely, it was completely disconnected. The meter was removed completely. So, thank you. I, I did, did have a constituent who did bring this up that they terminated their, their, their gas service, but they were still paying that $30 fee, uh, per or 20 or $30 fee, as you, as you said earlier. So there are people who have that, correct? Who don't use natural gas, they moved on to other technology. Do we have an idea of how many there are who are in that bucket? Like, um, again, through your worship, um, the, the more frequent things that we see from our customers are, are individuals, for example, are customers who are doing renovation work. Mm -hmm. And so they will, they will want the gas shut down, they'll leave the meter hanging, pay the monthly service charge, complete all of the interior renovation work that they want to do, and then reinstitute gas. So we see that scenario. We don't have a lot of customers who have completely disconnected but have left the meter. As I said, at the moment, I think we have two or three customers that I'm, that I'm aware of that are sort of pending and waiting to see what, if anything, will happen. Okay, I think I got one of those customers in my district. Uh, you, you may very well. Okay. <laughs> so, I, another question about the report is, Staff said that they were waiting for additional recommendations from staff moving forward. What kind of additional direction is staff looking for from council? A motion of council for further direction about this? Because albeit it's one constituent, it is still, uh, it still seems like a bucket or a group of people who, as we move away from natural gas and those who elect to, that will have these meters, but they're still paying a $30 charge to keep them there if this makes any, any sense. Yeah, like that, like there still are constituents and albeit three, um, but three, like the three people who are paying for a $20 a month fee for nothing. So like there's got, are we, there's gotta be a solution to this, right? Thank you for the question, Mr. Councillor, through you, your worship. Um, so Councillor, it is, you know, as you look forward, there, there could be more, there, there have not been many instances in the past we're not gonna to suggest to you what kind of direction you would, might give us. However, we just wanna point out um, you know, that 
these are real costs. It's, it's not a fee for nothing. Um, when the meter is installed, it could, the meter could be worth hundreds of dollars. We don't charge you for that. The cost of that is amortized into the monthly payments. So there is a real cost to that. And what we're trying to point out in the report is that there is a real cost. Someone has to pay it. Um, in the utility system, it's a user pay system. Mm -hmm. So we're just pointing that out to you. Um, if council wanted to change that or consider another option uh, with subsidies through the tax base, then we would take that direction at your discretion. Okay. So what, all right. Thank you. Uh, questions, Councillor Son. Um, if someone uh, disconnect their service, what was the reason to leave the meter on? Why the meter will be on there? Sorry, thank you for the question. Why would someone leave the meter on, just to clarify? So there's, through you, your worship, there's two options. One is that we leave the meter on, we know where the service is and we can maintain it. Uh, because as uh, my colleague said, at some point in the future, they might want the gas service restored. For example, the house could be sold and the next homeowner might want to have gas in the house. That's why they would typically leave it on. So it's a if, safety. If I don't want to use the gas, natural gas for now, but it's possible in the future I will sell the house or, so why, why should I mind to pay? If I want to have the meter on, I just don't want to use the gas. So why the other taxpayer should, should, should pay for the cost or utility pay for the cost? So, thank you for your question through your worship. So, um, there, there is a monthly cost for the co original cost of the meter, that's what you're paying for, and the support to have the meter, to make sure that it's, it's maintained. This, this is not my question. My, I, I just said, it, it's basically it's a comment, so if I want to, I decided not to use the gas, but I still want to have the meter, so it, it, it's my discretion, that if I want to meter, uh, have the meter on there. Or it's a utility's discretion, the utility think that they might well sell the house in the future, or they might come back to ask to reconnect the services. So utility decided to leave the meter on. Thank you for your question. I think I understand now. It's not our service fee, or they can have the service removed out to the road, and we're pointing out that there's a cost for that. If they remove it out to the road, and they sell the house, and a future homeowner wants to have gas, that homeowner is going to have to pay to have the, the service reinstalled. So I, I think it's clear then if a homeowner want to keep the meter on, then they should pay for it. Then if, if a utility has the mandate to leave the meter on, then we, we can think that customers should not pay for it because that's, that's a utility's problem. But customer has the choice to let the utility know, take the meter off or keep it on. So, so I'm only going to caution. Um, we could easily slip into a really extensive debate on what we should or should not do here, but that's just outside of the bounds here. So I'm just going to ask council just to stay to questions at this point, um, and then if council wants to go in that direction, we can or wants to do something, then obviously we would have that debate at that at that time. Your worship, my apology. Here. No, 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 no. It's okay. It's okay. Just, just, just to steer, not so much for you, but just in case we start to get other questions or comments in that direction. Um, next on my list is Councillor Chenani. Hi, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I was wondering, you had mentioned that, say, the meter costs like hundreds of dollars, and then it's split up into payments throughout um, a certain period of time. Um, would there be an option for paying a lump sum to just not have to pay for it anymore? Or is there like a constant um, um, cost to have it over time? Thank you for the question, through you, Your Worship. Yes, so just to be clear, when an, a new home is built or uh, new service is established, there is no additional upfront cost to the homeowner. So that's factored into their uh, monthly recurring costs over time. It's not just the cost of the meter, it's also the services to check and maintain that. We do um, service checks on all of our gas system um, frequently. So there's maintenance support. We have to make sure that it's uh, kept up, up to date. Um, Seals on meters have to be replaced uh, over time. The meter has to be replaced. It has a life cycle on it. 
Okay, thank you. Um, could there be, say, I don't know if this might be going off too, but um, you can tell me if I'm wrong. Um, could there be a program that, say it would be an incentive to be go greener and then you waive, we would waive the fees if you reach a certain um, emission um, reduction in your retrofitting kind of thing, so. I mean, I, I think, I'm not sure that that's a question that Mr. Fell can answer. Yeah. I mean, obviously, I think that that would be a, a political question for us to grapple with. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to answer. Uh, Councillor Shapes. Thank you. Uh, I think maybe my questions may have been answered, but uh, you had mentioned uh, the value of the meter would be amortized over a period of time. What would be that period of time? Um, <clears throat> through your worship, for uh, gas meters, um, typically we would have a 15 to 20 year life cycle on meters, depending upon uh, seal extensions, which a seal is basically guaranteeing the accuracy of the meter. Um, at some point, I would say in about the 20 to 25 year range, then the meter typically will get replaced out. It won't pass the seal verification process. Okay, so to follow up on that, you mentioned there's also service costs of servicing the meters. So would those costs, monthly costs, go down once we hit the amortization period? Uh, through you, Your Worship. Um, again, the amortization piece on a, attached to a meter is, is one part of the costs that are ongoing. So while the meter is still there, I think we all have to appreciate there is natural gas in that pipe and there's natural gas up to the meter while it's sitting there. The gas may be shut off to the house, but there's still an ongoing maintenance and operational cost associated with ensuring that that service is still safe. And if there's an issue with the service, then Utilities Kingston has to respond to that. Yes, I understand that. That's why I asked. I didn't ask if the, if the monthly billing went down to zero, but if it would actually go down after the amortization period. So thank, thank you for the question, Councillor, and through you, Your Worship. So we don't really, theoretically, we, we calculate that all of the fees across and distributed across the rate base. Um, would it theoretically go down? Well, that doesn't remove the replacement cycle. And then there's the maintenance. So every year, 20%, we report it to the board. We have obligations under the TSSA to inspect our network. Um, we have to go out and do um, leak detection, all of those kind of things. So we take all of those costs and figure out a formula across time for what is the fair amount of fee for a rate payer, just because they're not using the gas. As my colleague said, the gas is still in the system up to the meter. I understand that. And like I said, I think you've answered this one as well, but. If a, a client, a resident, had decided to basically take off the meter, and I, I saw the costs in your report, but if they sold the house and, this, and the new owner decided they want it back, um, would the cost be on the new owner if they wanted natural gas, and what would that be? Thank you for the Roughly question, speaking. Councillor, and through you, Your Worship. Uh, so yes, the way the bylaw is currently written, if a gas service is reinstalled to that property, it's not the first time, then it is the cost of the homeowner. Mm -hmm. And typically, it would be, roughly speaking, the same amount as disconnecting, plus probably a 10 to 20% premium on that. You can imagine there is more safety, caution, and due diligence involved in reconnecting and testing than there is in removing and capping. So it would be roughly the same as the numbers in the report and add about a 20% premium on it. So for a new homeowner, if that was the case, that would be on the high end up to approximately $20,000. That's correct, Council. That'd be hard for a new homeowner. Thank you. Okay, any other questions on report number one? Okay, uh, number two, climate lens framework. Councillor Glenn. Thank you, and through you. Um, thank you for this report. It's um, very heartening to see that we're moving uh, to looking at all the things we're doing through this lens. So just a couple of very quick questions. Um, as staff move to doing this, uh, could you just 
could someone just comment on how much time it will take for staff to do this and what we can expect in terms of reporting? Ms. Salter King. Uh, thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. The, the tool itself will be a very simple tool to use. We are beginning with a phased approach because we want to really have the uptake of staff in the implementation of the Climate Lens tool. So using the tool will take approximately five minutes at the most as a logic uh, branch uh, tool that we're developing in keeping with the Clean Air Partnership tool. Uh, we'll be working with staff, the Climate Leadership Division staff will be working with all staff and all departments who we've already met with uh, to demonstrate the tool and understand the use of the tool within our council reports. And as we move forward in with our phased approach, we'll be doing some training with staff and assisting them in uh, reporting out to, to council. One of the great benefits, I think, in, in the tool itself will be that there will be a climate consideration section in the report, which already a lot of uh, reports that you see uh, speak to climate action um, and the climate leadership plan actions, but it'll be pulled together in one area where you'll be able to, to review very easily uh, the results of the, uh, the climate lens tool. Okay, thank you. Um, it sounds like this is a great tool for us to start out with as a city. Um, with you know some understanding that at times what's coming to us is fairly complex, um, sort of what are the plans for the more complex uh, issues? So obviously building and planning being one of the more complex ones when we're looking at environmental considerations. So uh, if you can speak to what you're looking at doing now and, and in the future. Uh, so um, thank you and through you, Mr. Mayor. The uh, initially it will be a very qualitative um, uh, tool that will be used uh, in reporting out for every department. As you can see, it's a very unique tool and will be used for various uh, reporting out from various departments and to various committees as well. So initially, as I said, it'll be a very simple tool where it'll be very qualitative, indicating you know, if there's mitigation measures being undertaken or adaptation measures. And as we uh, train our staff and really get that fulsome uptake of the tool, we'll then be working with individual departments in refining the tool to become maybe more quantitative, uh, beginning to assess the GHG emissions, looking at adaptation and becoming uh, really more as a progressive matrix as we move forward through our phasing uh, training with our staff. Thank you very much. And uh, I want to thank staff for moving forward with us on these initiatives. I know that it's an extra few minutes of time that you'll be putting in, but it's much appreciated. And it's going to, I think, move the needle where we want to go with um, addressing climate concerns and considerations at the city. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Shapes. Thank you. Um, I know during planning I asked a lot of questions in regards to how, how environmentally friendly projects are and how uh, net zero they could be. I'm just wondering, would this uh, climate lens framework also include construction new developments? Uh, thank you, and through you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the climate lens would assess the GH emissions of city-owned uh, buildings if we are constructing new buildings uh, through the city corporation. But for private developments, um, the requirements of the Ontario Building Code would take effect. And so the climate lens would not be looking at the new construction. Now, saying that, we do have our Green Standard Community Improvement Plan that was approved by Council that does incentivize the construction of new buildings above and beyond the Ontario Building Code. And one of your strategic priorities as well speaks to um, staff bringing back a report uh, with respect to the province and their amendments to the Ontario Building Code with respect to green uh, building development. Um, that has been put on hold uh, until 2024, and at that time, staff will be bringing a report to council with respect to uh, the green standards within the uh, building bylaw as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm also concerned we seem to be adding more work to everyone, and I'm just wondering if there's, uh, if you have enough staff in order to develop this tool and uh, the extra work that could be involved. 
Uh, thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, we do have the staff. Uh, we are using the tool that was developed by the Clean Air Partnership uh, and uh, revising it to, to meet the needs of the City of Kingston. We have met with every uh, major department who will be using the Climate Lens as report out to committee and council um, with the understanding that we will be providing training and uh, rolling out some change management with respect to the use of the tool and some education on understanding not only the use of the tool, because as I said, it will be a very simple tool to use, but the reason why we're using it and tying it back to the strategic priorities of council and the climate leadership plan as well. Um, so we anticipate there'll be a great uptake with the, the, the tool itself. And that's why we really looked at a phased approach by bringing in a simple tool right now, um, getting everybody on board, getting the outcomes that we would like and the understanding of climate change, and then moving towards with other departments, um, refining that tool, becoming more specific to the needs of each department. Thank you. You mentioned education. I was just wondering, um, Considering we're going to be seeing a lot of those reports, would there be an opportunity for maybe an information session for council so we're aware what to expect and how this is going to be changing things in our view? Uh, absolutely. Um, I've been working with uh, Rob Hosier. We're going to be bringing back some um, climate leadership division work uh, orientation for council, I believe, in the new year. And we can certainly include the, uh, the climate lens and the tool and how that will work in the reporting out of that uh, tool to council within our orientation. Thank you, and I look forward to that. Okay, if there's no other questions, uh, number three, quarterly report, Kingston Police Services Board operating budget status as of June 30th, 2023. Number four, July 2023, tender and contract awards subject to delegation of authority. We have no information reports from members of council. Miscellaneous business, we have one motion, moved by Councillor Tozo, seconded by Councillor Stephen, that the resignation of Nicholas Togesi from the Municipal Accessibility Advisory Committee be received with regret. And in accordance with section 3.3.2D of the public appointment policy, Dorothy Ann Brown be appointed from the reserve pool to the Municipal Accessibility Advisory Committee for a term ending November 30th, 2024. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, on to new motions. We have one new motion this evening, moved by Councillor Chenani, seconded by Councillor Tozo. Whereas Kingston Strategic Plan 2023 to 2026, item 3.4.2, is to identify strategies to improve road safety and continue to implement the Vision Zero Road Safety Plan. And whereas other cities have used gateway speed limit signage to reduce neighborhood area speed limits to 40 kilometers per hour from the unsigned de facto speed limit of 50 kilometers per hour, and whereas neighborhood area speed limit gateway signage installed at all entry and exit points to and from bordering main roads can help set consistent expectations for motorists to get their speeds down when entering and traveling through neighborhoods. And whereas city staff have planned a review of all speed limits and neighborhood areas based on the pilot areas that have been in place since fall 2022. And whereas council has received many complaints and concerns regarding vehicle speeds in neighborhoods across the city. Therefore, be it resolved that council directs staff to report back to council with recommendations on a plan for speed limit reductions in all neighborhood areas by Q1 2024. Councillor Chinani, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I'll just keep this quick because uh, long meeting. Um, so, you know, speeding is an issue in all our neighborhoods, and that we've already seen many complaints. And this is one thing that we can do to help reduce speeds. Um, with other measures of traffic calming and pedestrian crossings and uh, uh, community safety zones, I believe this uh, reflects what the public has been wanting to see. Uh, it sets a clear expectation to slow down in our neighborhoods. Um, a change to the default of 50 kilometers an hour to 40 kilometers an hour in our neighborhoods is moving in the right direction. Um, I have seen this in other cities and we did some pilots and I think it's time to fully implement this. Uh, I look forward to hearing your comments. Okay, thank you, Councillor Shapes. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would say that uh, one number of issues that we do hear about is speeding and uh, traffic calming. And I was actually thinking of doing something similar, but in regards to community safety zones, because I know there's gonna be a lot of areas that could be void of that. I was just wondering, um, I, if I don't need to put the motion in, I just want to ask staff um, that although I'm aware that uh, community safety zones are being put in place at all school locations across the city, 
is there a way to have more community safety zones in areas that council would have concerns with? And if so, are there any criteria or limitations? And how would we do that? Mr. Supple. Um, Mr. Zub, we cannot hear you. You're not on mute, but we don't hear anything. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sir? Yes, we can. Okay. My apologies. Um, uh, thank you for questioning through you. Um, so the community safety zone is a tool that, um, as, as you noted in the motion, is uh, something that we've started to implement as a priority around the schools in our city. Um, but that does not mean that that is the only location that can, it can be added. So um, under the Highway Traffic Act, uh, councils have the ability to add community safety zones um, in areas of, of the city that they deem um, that they deem appropriate. Uh, many councils set a series of guidelines or ways in which that can be assessed. Um, and that is, uh, that is part of the process that we would be looking at sort of as sort of a natural step once the, um, once the rollout of the community safety zones in the school areas is complete. Okay, thank you. Um, Cause that's what I was waiting for, for all the schools, the community zones to be rolled out. But since we're here, I thought I'd ask the question. So would that be a, an email recommendation to you directly, or would that be a motion through council if we want to make a certain area a community safety zone? Uh, through through your, your worship. Uh, so it is, a, it is a, a change that we make in the, um, in the bylaw. So it comes through either as, as part of a report that's brought to, um, to council by staff, um, or it comes through as a motion. Um, it's as part of the work that that is spoken to in this motion i think we can provide some uh some direction about about a process that could be set up for that and, and as you noted i think some of the the criteria that would be associated with it okay uh final question whether the limitations would they only be neighborhood roads or could main artery roads be included to our collectors um through your worship um I, so it, it, we would need to look at, I think, the specific roads. Uh, it does speak to the, the roads within a municipality um, as part of the highway traffic act. But we can certainly provide more information about how, that, um, how the community safety zones can be expanded to other areas in the city beyond where it is right now. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councilor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Uh, Excellent motion, Councillor Chenani. I was very pleased to second it. A question I have for staff is, does this give enough flexibility to increase the amount of signage? Because it's one thing for the speed limit to be reduced. It's another thing for people to see it. Uh, I noticed in some of the districts where this has been piloted, there is uh, much more obvious signage. Uh, is this motion give enough breadth to increase signage for speed limits? Mr. Uh, through, yeah, uh, thank you for the question through you, um, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so part of the, uh, certainly the motion speaks to, I think, the, the information that we would bring, bring back to council. Uh, that certainly from, from staff's understanding would include the, the resourcing um, um, and you know, items necessary to implement that. The, the implementation of the, of the neighborhood um, speed reductions would look very similar to what's already in place in Strathcona. Um, park and in Westwoods. So yes, there would be a significant number of signs and changes to existing signs required um, as part of this piece. But that's that's all some of the details that we can bring back um, as as uh, part of this um, report if if council passes the motion. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else, uh, Councillor Sanek. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I support this motion. Uh, you know, we get speed concerns all the time. Um, a question to uh, Mr. Sempo, please. And so uh, just to follow on with um, Councillor Shave's uh, questions about community safety zones. So to bring a new community safety zone forward, we have to wait until all the schools that you have ready to become community safety zones have been implemented before we can bring a motion to council to um, do a new community safety zone? Is that what I just heard? 
Um, through through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, thank you for your question, Councillor Osanic. Uh, no, that, that's not the case. I guess what I'm suggesting is we are in the midst of rolling out a number of community safety zones based on, based on the approved plan by Council to prioritize the school areas for that work. Um, so we, we Council, I'll just looking at the wording of what's in the Highway Traffic Act says that Council may by bylaw designate a part of a highway under its jurisdiction as a community safety zone if in council's opinion public safety is of special concern on that part of the highway so um i did not mean to imply that it, it's not possible for you to bring a motion forward right now i was more indicating the work that we have underway and the direction that we previously had was to complete the work as a priority in the school areas and then move forward from there Thank you, and just uh, one question left uh, as a follow-up to that. When do you think um, that work would be finished when all those schools would be rolled out as community safety zones? Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, that the tentative plan now, so we're on the final, we're finishing up the, or just starting the final phase of the third phase of schools um, right now, so they that work should be completed this fall um, ahead of the ahead of the winter season, and then we would be um, presumably moving on to um, other approaches um, in preparation for for other changes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Son. Thank you, Your, Your Worship, and through you, uh, my question also related to uh, Councillor uh, Shades. Uh, uh, question. Uh, community safety zone for the school, uh, you ask for a particular example and I can give you that example. The new school built in, in my district, the French school, the, the Catholic and, and the public French school, um, they are right on the uh, Taylor Kidd Boulevard. So is that Taylor Kidd Boulevard can be uh, counted as part of the, or can include it part of the community safety zone? That's the one part. The second part is um, how much area are we obligated to cover the certain area by the, under the bylaw or uh, provincial uh, highway act or by, by bylaws, or we choose how much area we, we can cover. And that's, again, the good example that um, the Wheat Hill Drive on, uh, on the close to that school is finish the uh, community safety zone block and a half before the uh, Centennial Drive. And from Centennial Drive turning on to Weed Hill is, is very um, dangerous because it's the senior people live on that part of the uh, road. And they're just right on the road, not have enough space to back up safely. And they have been asking for that. And I was thinking if we can, or if there's a possibility to increase uh, such areas in, in, in such situation, we just cover a little bit more area, like a block and a half more, and uh, you know, just studying a little bit more how far we can go and which areas can be. Also, uh, not only the school uh, roads, but people living around, the community living around the schools, they have young families too, especially, again, as that's example for, that's a new subdivision, a lot of young family with the children moving there as well. And then they will be beneficial from that, uh, uh, creating that community safety zone in, 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 in that area particularly. So there's two examples I gave you that, uh, if you can answer that. Uh, thank you for your question and through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so yes, any, any, um, any roadway could be designated. So I think your, your example, uh, your first example, that, that, would, that would be possible. Um, the, the other aspect about sort of the delineating where the community safety zones are again it would be it would you know council may designate where those where those zones go in it i would suggest that um there certainly are a lot of questions certainly a lot of questions here tonight about community safety zones but also likely a lot of information that we can provide um, in the future report that maybe would speak to some of the best practices and the way in which um, analysis or recommendations could come from staff on that related to the way that um, traffic safety and um, other guidelines and standards are used. Um, but certainly it, it ultimately under the Highway Traffic Act, uh, council may, may designate those areas. 
Okay, anybody else on new motion number one? Councillor Tanny, you have the last word. Is there anything else you want to add? Um, thank you. Um, so um, I just want to say like safety in our neighborhoods is something that's important to all of us. And uh, this is one method to help make our streets safer. And I think that this and community safety zones are things that can work well together. Um, and I want to thank you all for the discussion. And it is my hope that you will all support this. Thank you. Okay, we'll call the vote on new motion number one. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, we have no other new motions. Any notices of motion? Uh, if not, Madam Clerk, ask for minutes, please. Moved by Councillor Ridge, seconded by Councillor Stephen, that the minutes of City Council meeting number 2023-2023, held Tuesday, September 5th, 2023, be confirmed. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Uh, we, we have a number of communications. Is there any other business? Councillor McLaren? Thank you. Just as an update to everybody, the... Um, on the co-op, uh, we were incorporated back in the spring, but uh, over the summer, we were bitten by an ugly green monster of anxiety and not really knowing what to do. However, we have really good partners and uh, a telephone call to uh, CAO Hurdle and an introduction to Brent Funnel has actually moved us in the direction that we want to go now. So as of tomorrow, we will actually be approaching um, formally several architects to start the process to get the multi-million dollar grants. And I have to thank our partners, the city, of course, speaking as the chair of the um, co-op, that uh, this is exactly what partners do, helping each other. Sometimes we get it out of uh, dark times, and uh, thank you very much for that. So we should be hearing about uh, actual who we'll be picking in the next few weeks, maybe a month or so. Okay, thank you. Councillor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. I'll be very brief. I just want to recognize that CADCO recently uh, honored the 40 under 40, uh, which are 40 of the young makers. Uh, and one of those recipients of that award was uh, Councillor Gregory Ridge, who is sitting a few seats down. Um, Councillor Ridge uh, has a long career, despite being under the age of 40, um, <laughs> in service to the community. I, sorry, this is going to turn into a little bit of a roast, Your Worship, I just asked for that. He, uh, working with, in the constituency office, he brought $2 million back to the community with a tax clinic. He has worked for Queen's University, and he is now the counselor for uh, Kingstown. So uh, the 40 under 40 honored people who were involved in business, uh, in media, and in politics. I uh, am from what I could hear from the event, it was a grand gala, uh, a bon soiree, and a very special levy, which we all know Councillor Ridge really enjoys. Uh, so thank you and congratulations to my fellow Councillor Ridge, and thank you, congratulations to all those who are 40 under 40. Very good. Any other business? Councillor Stephen. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. I just wanted to remind everyone that this coming Thursday, just in light of the, the recent conversation about road safety, um, the Ontario Legislature will be starting up again shortly, and uh, there will be a Kingston Community Consultation on Road Safety, talking about Bill 40, the Moving Ontarian Safely Act. The community consultation is happening here at City Hall and Memorial Hall from 5 to 7 this coming Thursday. Thanks. Okay, very good, thank you. Madam Clerk, cross for bylaws, please. Moved by Councillor Osanek, seconded by Councillor Glenn, that bylaws one through four be given their first and second reading. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Moved by Councillor Osanek, seconded by Councillor Glenn, that bylaws one through four be given their third reading. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Motion to adjourn, please. Moved by Councillor Ridge, seconded by Deputy Mayor Osterhoff. All those in favor? Opposed, and we are adjourned. Thank you very much.